This meeting, meeting is being broadcast on YouTube and published to the council, but it will also be available for on-demand on demand viewing. Please be aware that microphones in the room pick up noise from paper and other wrestling objects. Further be aware that microphones can pick up side conversations. Cliff, will you begin us with a roll call? Cliff Strachan. Brian Jones. Dave Sewell. George Handley. Kate Van Buren. Gary Winterton. David Harding. George George. Here. Wayne Parker. Thank you. And Don Jarvis, our sustainability <laughs> sustainability director, will give us an opening prayer. Father and gentlemen, we're grateful for the opportunity to gather together to discuss the business of the city. We're grateful for the opportunities we have to serve good people in this community, good employees we have the opportunities to work together to make things better, preserve this wonderful earth that was given us, and to preserve the, the wealth and the beauty of this, this city, people that bless us with a, a sense of what we're planning to do and what affects our decisions they have on others. Bless us with a see the long run as well as the short run. So we're very impressed in this. Thank you, Don. Let's propose that we approve the following minutes of January 30th, 2018, the council retreat, February 6th, 2018, work meeting, March 6th, 2018, a work meeting, March 20th, 2018, council retreat on waste on the wastewater treatment. Are there any changes or additions or corrections to those minutes that are in your list? Seeing none, I declare these minutes approved by unanimous consent. We'd like to um, welcome Sean uh, Pond from C Span, C Pace, C Span. <laughs> I'd be more entertaining than C Span. Welcome from C Pace, um, and um, we'll let you introduce yourself a little bit. We have a presentation. For you. Thank you so much, and thank you to the Provo City Council for hosting me. I'm Shauna Kwan with the Governor's Office of Energy Development, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about CPACE. So for those of you that are familiar with it, thank you for bearing with me. I'm going to go through what is CPACE just at a very high level, talk about some of the benefits to CPACE. And recently, in the 2017 state legislative session, we passed updates to how the program works. So I'll talk through those at a high level as well and summarize with how that affects the city and the city's role given these updates. So very briefly, what is CPACE? Well, ultimately, it kind of boils down to zero down, 100% financing for commercial buildings to fund energy improvements. And under Utah state law, this is financing that's eligible for up to 30 years, which is actually um, beyond the national best practice. National best practice is 20 to 25 years. We allow for up to 30 years or the expected life of the improvement. And what we mean by commercial buildings is actually quite broad. And so that can include an apartment building with multiple rental units, an industrial facility, or a commercial facility that's an office or retail, whatever the traditional commercial you can think of. And then when we talk about energy improvements, that's also quite a broad brush. We're talking about energy efficiency, we're talking about renewable energy, battery storage, EVs, water conservation. So it's quite a broad scope, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more later on in my presentation. Oh, and please... If you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to stop and take any questions you have. So why do we do CPACE? What, what are the benefits behind CPACE? Well, we kind of break it down for every stakeholder involved in CPACE project. We have cities, we have property owners, capital providers, also known as lenders, and then we also have mortgage holders. So in the case of the city, what we see is that oftentimes when a commercial building undergoes an energy improvement, or an energy efficiency improvement in particular, it can reduce the emissions from that area source, from that specific building, which can help improve our air quality. And along the Wasatch Front, we all know that that's a critical issue that we're all very invested in. We've also found that CPACE can improve building value and result in better economic development outcomes. We have better operating buildings, we often have better tenant retention, and I'll talk about that with the property owner benefits. For property owners, this is incredibly competitive financing. With the recent changes in interest rates, we kind of expect that financing available to commercial property owners is going to change a little bit. 
And what we often find is a large obstacle to doing these big capital improvement projects is a property owner doesn't necessarily either have the capital in hand or the, the terms that they need are not as necessarily competitive. So CPS is a really compelling case for a property owner. And oftentimes we find that once they've done the improvement, they get better operations, maintenance, tenant, uh, excuse me, tenant retention, tenant satisfaction. And in some cases, we even see a net positive cash flow. Because CPACE can be financed for over 30 years, you have a set amortization schedule. And so that's a consistent payment every single year. And oftentimes we see the energy savings are actually exceeded. So you end up with a positive cash flow. And with the project we've completed in West Valley City on Hunt Electric headquarters, they did an analysis a year after they had done the installation and found that they were cash flow positive. So it's a really great local case example. What was that name again? West Valley City? What was the... So it was Hunt Electric headquarters in West okay. Valley City. Mm -hmm. Capital providers, for them it's actually compelling financing as well because it, the actual financing mechanism, which is the voluntary assessment and an assignable lien, is secured against the real property. So for them, it's not tied to the individual building owner. For them, it's the real property. So it is secured financing. And in addition to that, because it relies on an assessment, that actually takes first position on a, on a property. So in the case of mortgage holders, they do consent to that. This is not usurping their position, but it does give mortgage holders the opportunity to increase the building, building value on which they have a mortgage. And it can also result in their borrower's improved ability to repay the mortgage. Going back to that positive cash flow, again, that building owner then has a better ability to repay the mortgage. <coughs> As I mentioned, CPACE has gone through a couple of iterations and a lot of learning. There's been national best practices put together. Internally in the state of Utah, we've done a number of stakeholder conversations, a lot of really deep thinking about what works about the original CPACE program and what perhaps could be improved upon. So I'm going to lay out four sort of scopes that we improved upon with CPACE 2.0, as we'll call it. It was passed by Senator Adams in the 2017 legislative session, SB 173. So the very first element is we've updated how projects can be financed. So under the original structure, we had a municipality place a voluntary assessment on a property, issue an assessment bond, and then the lender or capital provider buys it and the sale of that goes and pays for the project. We found that it was a bit onerous for a number of the stakeholders involved. Municipalities didn't necessarily want to be responsible for issuing a bond for a commercial project. We also found that bonds tend to be a little more expensive from a fee perspective. So it wasn't necessarily the best instrument we could use to secure financing. So a new alternative that we've created is an assignable lien. So we still have the voluntary assessment placed on the property, and then we place an assignable lien on the property and assign that to the capital provider in lieu of a bond. So this gets rid of the bond, makes it much simpler for stakeholders involved, and then once the capital provider is assigned the lien, they just finance directly with the property owner. So it's a little bit cleaner mechanism for handling the financing. So does that take the city out of it? Before we were, we were doing they used us to, as the bondholder. Yes. Does that take us out now? So the city, city would still be responsible for placing the assessment and the lien. And I'll talk to that administration component in this piece as well. The other clarification that we added into the legislation is that the CPACE assessment and the assignable lien or the assignable bond are not the obligation of the administrator. So what do we mean by administrators? Well, now we have three options. We have the original option, which was this, assign this ass assessment bond that was issued by the city. As an alternative, we now allow for assignable liens to be issued by the executive of the local municipality. So in this case, it would be your mayor. So she would have the ability to place the voluntary assessment and lien on the property. A final option is now what we call the CPACE district. What we heard from a lot of cities and counties was that they didn't necessarily have the resources in-house to do CPACE. It is a bit involved, it is a bit of an undertaking. Our office has been involved with it for a number of years now. And so what we heard was that we need somebody to really take a lot of the detail of putting projects together, make closing out projects, and taking care of that on our behalf. So the CPACE district is administered by our office, the Governor's Office of Energy Development. And if the city chooses to, you can opt into our district and we can do the projects on your behalf. And I'll get into that specific component in the next slide. 
We've also expanded on the scope of eligible projects. That was something we heard was in demand from our various stakeholders. So we've added hybrid elevators and escalators, also known as hybrid vertical transport devices. That's the first time I've heard that. We included parking automation and seismic upgrades. Those are components we've heard are something building owners are looking for. So we've added that to the scope of projects. And I know renewable energy is really the important topic right now. There have been limitations on renewable energy, specifically in rural electrical co-ops. And what we've seen Rocky Mountain Power do is actually cap renewable energy at two megawatts for an existing building and then allow any size renewable energy project for brand new construction. So we do have a little bit of boundaries placed on it. Ultimately, our position as the office is we really encourage the energy efficiency first and then do a right size renewable energy. We often see that building owners benefit the most when they look at the scope of improvements and don't just do one single solar system. And then finally, we found that it's a little more useful to read this code, which is a 50 page uh, long reading. We found it works better in a separate component of the code. That way you can see exactly what's applicable to CPACE and what isn't. It's separate from the Area Assessment Act. And finally, we no longer require that contractors are pre-vetted before they're allowed to do projects. We just found from an enforcement perspective that it was too challenging to figure out whether the general contractor and or his subs needed to be vetted. So we ultimately eliminated that component from the program. So what does this mean for the city? Now that we have both an assignable lien and an assessment bond. Well, there's three options. And the very first one, which of course I recommend because we're helping advance the CPACE district, is allowing the CPACE district to do projects on behalf of the city of Provo. What that would entail is passing a resolution, opting into the program. And then we would start project management from the very beginning all the way to the very end. We would do education and outreach. We would pre-vet projects. We would find capital providers. We would then take care of the voluntary assessment and the assignable lien process at the county recorder's office and facilitate the financing agreement. So we would handle the project from beginning to close. And the compelling part is this is at no cost to the city. We recognize it's a lot to ask to impose those types of costs. So the way we're recouping costs internally is we're charging a small fee against projects and that allows us to recover our expenses and it's not a burden on taxpayers or for the city. Another option is to still administer locally if that's what you're interested in doing, and you would do so under the assignable lien process. That would mean you're responsible for developing and vetting projects, deciding what terms, if you had any restrictions on renewable energy, for example, and then finally, your mayor would handle placing the voluntary assessment and assignable lien on each commercial property. And then in this case, the city would actually be responsible for collecting repayment and remitting it to the capital provider or deciding if they wanted to take a different project program dynamic and just have the capital provider collect those directly. And finally, the third option is very similar, but it's just using the assessment bond in lieu of an assignable lien and the roles and responsibilities of the city would be virtually the same with the exception that the city council would be responsible for placing the assessment and issuing the assessment bond. That's a lot I've thrown at you very quickly, but that's all for my presentation. Um, just wanted to leave time for questions if you had any. I thought there was a thank you slide in there, but can I missed it. Uh, yes. So you mentioned that you're enlarging your scope to um, parking elevators and one other. Seismic upgrades. Seismic so. upgrades. And mm -hmm. how does that relate to energy savings and like the original program? It's a good question. What we've discovered is that the initial intent of the energy improvements is now being extended to safety considerations. So that's why we're seeing other states taking on seismic as well and how they try to balance out the additional cost of those upgrades is also doing a complementary efficiency upgrade. So you end up getting some of the energy savings to cover the cost of the seismic upgrades. Seismic is safety, parking is safety? So there's interesting components to parking. Um, there's some cases that are made that less idle time when you can automate the parking so you end up with reduced emissions from cars and so you can improve air quality. I, I, I was surprised when I read that too. And, and elevators. And elevators are also an energy saving measure. From what I understand, as they're descending, it generates an actual motor inside which produces energy to pull it back up again. Hmm. Technology is interesting. <laughs> Those are all marginal, right? Marginal in what sense? 
energy savings? Oh, sure. We would encourage a building owner to conduct a level two or three ASHRAE audit, which would have an auditor come through, do a complete facility evaluation, and identify every single measure that they could to produce significant energy savings. Those three we just talked about are pretty much the only savings. Absolutely, I agree. Yes. So the, the seismic isn't necessarily going to save you any money in, in energy, but it will preserve the structure and depending on the size of the earthquake. Absolutely. So that, uh, if you're looking to safeguard your mortgage, your business, your future, that can be a real important item. That's very compelling, yeah. So we passed this a year and a half ago mm -hmm. or so. Um, I've just been a little disappointed that we haven't had any applications come in. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of looking at like what changes can we make have to publicize it better because this is something that this is a program I'd like to see people taking advantage of and, and look where that disappointment is. Um, Can I sure. provide an answer to that? So, um, standing up the CPS district has been a significant overhaul of the original programs and materials that we had in place. So, that's what we've been doing for the last year. We brought in SRS Sustainable Real Estate Solutions to help us re rewrite all of our documentation start planning education and outreach events. And so May 1st is our planned launch date. And that's why we're already reaching out to cities today because we want to hit the ground running. We want to see if they're willing or interested in opting in. We take care of that sooner rather than later so that we can start handling projects in May. The, so the, I guess the other thing is looking at the three options. Mm -hmm. um, I think you did a good job explaining you know, how the assignable liens will eliminate some of the overhead and the headache um, from the floor. Um, I'm just wondering, are there any advantages of option two over option one? I mean, I know you're recommending sure. option one, but what, why, why might we consider something other than one? So if you had really particular outcomes you expected to see from CPACE and you wanted to pass an ordinance to require that, so you didn't have quite a standardized program the way the rest of the state would operate, I can see under that structure why you would go for option two rather than option one we're responsible for executing the state law and so for us we're not going to impose as many restrictions beyond what's in state law and then i guess the last question would be for the administration um you know if, if we were to do two or three you know, that's adding work to us uh, what, what what's the administration's thoughts on on these three options my one thought is not on that, but wondering, you passed it a year and a half ago, is that correct? And you haven't had any So how did you advertise it or get it out to the public? We haven't. We made it available and hoped that people would know about it. And you know, we do have some champions that we should have done more. Um, but the fact that net metering was excluded was a significant deterrent. Some people did ask about it. And that meeting was concluded. Not interesting. And so if this I may. This is a possibility now to change to add net metering to our seat basin if the city council was, was agreed on it. At the time, we were worried about, about the uh, price for net metering. There was a lot of discussion. It was very up in the air. And I think we were wise to postpone that. Now that's settled. I don't know why we couldn't add it. And we understand there's a significant education and outreach component to CPACE. So we have relationships with BOMA, with the Utah Association of Counties, with the Association of General Contractors, the Utah Business Association. We understand there's a lot involved in making folks aware of CPACE. So that's why we're, we understand it's a big burden to take on. And that's why we're willing to do it as a CPACE district. Can the decision to go, how do you switch back, can you switch back and forth at any time or every year or? So our preference obviously is to opt in for a number of years so it can be simpler for property owners and contractors to know what the scope of the program is going to look like for them. They're not going to face any surprises from one year to the next. So what we ask for is that there's an opt-in agreement that we would have a city council review, the city attorney review, make sure they're comfortable with it. And if you choose that you want to disengage from the CPS district, you can do so. There's a clause in the agreement. So when you go to uh, try to recruit or advertise, you say it was Hunt Electric? Mm -hmm. 
So if you have a positive example and you can go to a big business and say, this is what they did, these are things you can do, it can be cash positive or close to it or whatever, mm -hmm. and that they can just see how it works and, and how it pencils, yep. uh, that, that's powerful rather than just going on the theory or, gee, you know, it's going to be clean and, and, and energy efficient, but when it actually starts saving them money, and we have case studies from Hunts Electric because we know it's more compelling than just saying, well, in theory, we know that less emissions from buildings or you end up reducing your energy consumption, things like that. So that's a component of the CPACE district as well, is that as we complete projects, we'll develop case studies so folks can see, oh, I own an office building as well. This is what they accomplished. There's likely some comparisons that I can achieve as well. What did they do? What did they use their funding for mostly? So Hunt Electric did a solar canopy for parking, and then they added an EV charger to that that was charged by the solar array. I got a question for Don. I know there was talk on the sustainability committee of sort of making this a little more competitive. Is one way to kind of encourage uh, your businesses or property owners to want to measure up favorably compared to others in terms of how much energy they were saving? Or? I think you may be just remembering uh, option one. We, we mentioned that the, that the, uh, the legislature had approved option one, which was more more attractive to cities. I don't know that it's more attractive to, to the, to the uh, uh, contract. Oh, okay. If I could mention, it actually is more compelling if they know that they're entering a standardized program. So if they're doing projects, let's say in Provo, but then they want to go to Orem, they're not going to be having two very different conversations about how CPACE works between those two cities. So from a contractor and building owner perspective, they actually see a lot of benefit in having continuity between program design. Oh, go ahead, Dave. I really like this new option one. I I feel like it gives us pretty much all the same benefits with a lot lower overhead for, for us as a city. And then as far as the publicity and getting people involved, I think one of the hurdles that we had was that we were the first one in Utah County, I think the second one in the state, to, to get on board with this. And the, the um, hurdle in terms of administrative overhead was higher initially. So we didn't have other cities in the valley that had joined with us. But I think with this new program, I'm hopeful and optimistic that we'll get a number of other cities in the valley that will join with us and we'll get some sort of becomes a norm. Yeah, it becomes a, a norm and we'll get some momentum going, people become more aware of it. And then it sounds like the uh, governor's office is gonna put in some more effort on on publicity and outreach mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, we'll be offering trainings to each stakeholder group because we understand that um, there's a lot of national stakeholders interested in doing projects in Utah, and so they want to know exactly the parameters of Utah's code and Utah's law so that they can do projects successfully here. Is there a cap on how many cities can participate where the state is the administrator on that? Ideally, we can do projects on behalf of the whole state, right, so that we can maximize the benefit of CPACE. Oh, originally we were reluctant, at least on the solar part of it. But now that that's been resolved, I don't see a reason why we would want to uh, do it on option two, where we could put in restrictions. And so I'm comfortable with option one, where it's just uniform, we are do it allowing in Provo, what's allowed elsewhere, and uh, we since we've solved the solved the solar, I, I just can't see a reason to hold back and make ours different. I, I wonder about the solar though. I I'm not sure as I talk with the energy department with the changes that are coming so quickly, the more efficiency, the more. Um, I wonder where we're at. I'm still not sure that we're completely finished with solar issues. Well, well. I'm sure we're not as technology changes, but in theory, solar and, and all those technologies become more economical and, and cost effective, and you won't have to subsidize them as much. And that was the question is how much we were subsidizing solar, and as we changed that, came to a compromise, and as we go forward, it might be a, a better deal for solar because their costs go down, but our subsidy is fixed. 
But we're still subsidizing, and we're, we're, are we still comfortable with that, I guess, is the question. We, we came to a comfortable compromise, and I, I think it was a lot of hard work. Well, it was. Yeah. So I think we've got a couple more minutes left on all these items, but uh, I'm curious, what are, is this sort of decision point here? What, what does this look like? Do we potentially, if we want to move forward, say with, and I'll, I'll see, interested if there's a motion, but if we want to move forward with one, option one, do we just ask to put this on a, on a full council meeting, or do we bring this back? In the, in the, what's, what's the next step, I guess? So I've provided the opt-in agreement to uh, Councilman Sewell, and so I'm happy to share it with the rest of the council as well, with the city attorney. I would imagine you'd want to review that, make sure you're comfortable with it before we, as the next step. I, I think that that's important to get ready. Mr. Jones involved in I'm halfway through right now. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Okay. So, I think what I would be hoping for is a motion to, uh, as an expression of intent, to to move move ahead with option number one if, if the administration is comfortable moving in that direction, and to uh, remove the previous restriction that we had on solar energy projects, and then uh, I guess the administration would negotiate the agreement and bring it back to us when it's ready to sign. I'd like the energy department to be weighing in on that, those restrictions. I'd just like to hear from them um, with regard to what they feel like, um, how this, if, if there's a, if they see any challenges with that. Would they not normally? See, see that it's important? Yeah. I don't know that they would, it would necessarily, if, if we're adopt, I'd like to talk with them before we adopt the district personally. We can bring that up in our next board meeting. Okay. I would like I would like that. I'm happy to make myself available if there's any questions I can answer for them. Any input from the administration? Isaac, is this something that you see as being a good thing to do? Yeah, I, I think clearly so. And option one is uh, the real concern I had with the other options is these come along so infrequently that it's pretty easy to lose the process quickly and uh, I don't I think we would likely not respond as quickly or uh, accurately maybe as the as the state would uh, doing these routinely and all the time so setting up an administrative process for something that might only happen every you know very infrequently might be a little tough for us so I think from our perspective we would love to see if you want to continue with CPACE we should probably take option one So what specifically is the commitment the city makes besides authorizing the district to administer work? What are the commitments or what are their agreements? What are their... So it ultimately just allows us to be able, you are granting us the authority to do projects in your jurisdiction is ultimately what we're looking for. We don't ask for a reporting requirement from the city or anything like that. Are you like, using our bonding ability? Again, they were no. told this would not affect our bond ratings at all. We do not touch bonding. We would actually have to be responsible for engaging our state treasurer. And so we were very decided that bonds are not how we want to operate the CPACE district. We exclusively deal with assignable liens. Sorry, that was very forceful, but I, I we, we did not want to take on assi assessment bonds as our That's responsibility. Great. And I don't think so. I, we were told that we weren't really responsible. We were in a safe position anyway, but I just assume not do that. There's some George. I'm in favor of removing the solar exclusion. I don't think there's a problem with that. It was because we had kind of a confusion on how we were going to do that net metering. I also would be with Wayne and David on option one. I, I, I can't see those other options as being, particularly because of the lack of infrastructure that you would have to take care of them. Just in, in uh, can't think of the word, just take more time, but because of time, I have a concern for time, I'll, I'll make a motion, unless you want to make it, I would, I'll, I'll make the motion that um, we 
uh, direct the, the administration to enter into negotiations um, to discuss with the, the um, energy department, but to, to move forward with option one uh, without solar restrictions, assuming that the, the discussion goes well, um, and put together a proposal and bring it back to us. Director probably isn't the right word, request. <laughs> so I would make the motion that the council requests those things. Any more, any discussion on the motion? Any those in favor? That passes unanimously. Uh, thank you so much for the time for coming down. We appreciate you using this. And we look forward to talking with you. As do I. I think we'll have some really exciting projects underway. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Sure. We have a presentation now from Downtown Provo Inc. and Quinn Peterson is here to give us an update on Downtown Provo. So the purpose of our visit today is really just to kind of remind you who we are and what we're doing. Um, we're not asking you to vote on anything special, but we're just going to kind of give you an update on some of the projects that we've been working on so that we can continue to have your support that we've had over the past several years. So a little bit of a summary on Downtown Provo Inc., our organization, if you're not familiar. I think I've had to sit down with every one of you, but just real quickly. Um, Downtown Provo Inc. has existed in its current capacity since 2011. Um, something like it has existed since the 60s. It's kind of ebbed and flowed as far as how they operate, what their focus is, and how they're funded. But we've existed in our, our current uh, capacity since 2011. And um, Wayne was a huge part of setting that up back then, and uh, that's the way that we still function. So. I myself, I'm Quinn Peterson. Um, I've had a home here in Provo for about six years and I ran the farmer's market for a couple years and this is my second year running uh, downtown Provo Inc. Um, so uh, we are a third party nonprofit that receives funding from uh, business support in the downtown community and also from, um, from the city. So our board of directors that helps guide the decisions that we make consists of our primary funders and local business owners. And we have a couple of those board members here today and they can just, if they just quickly introduce themselves, we've got Jeff. My name is Jeff Rose. I'm one of the principals of Wallover Media. I'm the owner of Standard Street University. Um, I've been here since 2011. Um, I've been working here since 2011. We're involved in DPI because we understand that Provo is a great place for us to have our business and we want to see it continue to get better. And, and see the growth that we've seen in the past. And Jeff was just made the vice chair two months ago. And we have to come on you, community relations manager, and we, we were part of the, the founding of this new structure, Downtown Provo Inc., um, as an institution, and, and we are part of the community, and we will be invested in what happens downtown Provo so that our faculty and students and the whole campus community feels integrated into the program. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have 13 board members. Um, this is just two. We wanted to give them an opportunity to come out and introduce themselves and make some comments throughout. So um, I'm going to just run through a handful of things, but please feel, uh, feel free to ask questions about our projects or anything that you want to know about downtown as I'm covering this stuff. We'll see what we can answer. Sure. <clears throat> So we have um, Jaime Alonzo from Zions Bank. We have Dean Judd. He's the chair right now from Gurus. Uh, we have Doug Lund. He represents New Skin. We have Brandon Barney. He represents Coca-Cola. We have Steve Anderson. He rep represents UVU. Um, we have Ron Aral from the Chamber. We have Joel Raker from the uh, UVCB. Um, uh, Dixon Holmes currently represents the city, um, and let's see. Uh, 
And then we do we did just expand our board so that we could have more involvement from the small businesses. And that board meets with us quarterly. And that includes Justin Williams from Rockwell Ice Cream, Scott Glenn from Pioneer Book, Pete Tidwell from The Mighty Baker, and Andrews Taylor from uh, the startup place. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, at the beginning of each year, we sit down and we make a new priority list. We try to determine what is the main focus of our downtown? Um, how can we improve it? Our main objective is to increase uh, awareness in regards to tourism and to increase awareness uh, with our current residents. They're very different targets, um, but a lot of our residents don't know what our downtown has to offer yet. And so we try to market ourselves to them as well. Um, this priority list that we create has a lot to do with infrastru infrastructure improvements like lighting downtown or public art um, or vacancy policies or helping with a parking situation. Um, when, uh, when Michelle was running for election, we, had, we asked her hard questions, the business community did. Thanks for killers. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the questions that we wanted to know, um, we actually asked Mayor Curtis before he left, um, if you were to pick your number one priority for the next term, what would you say it is? And I just want to share with you his insight because it helps guide what we do with downtown Provo. He said, Quinn, every morning I wake up and I knock on a door. And if the door doesn't open, I move to the next door. And if that door doesn't open, I move to the next door. And it may be a door that hasn't opened in 15 years and suddenly it opens. And that's the direction we go. And I think it's important that we keep that mentality because too often we can get focused on what we're going to accomplish. And if that door is not opening, we need to quit pounding it down or else we're not going to be productive. And so we try to make a large list of what our priorities are downtown and we run with whatever we can, we can accomplish. So um, I can share that list with you later, but we've, we've got a, a list of a handful of things that we've um, accomplished recently. Um, one is the BRT art. Can we jump to the other one? Sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, the new bus rapid transit system, which now is called UVX, is that right, Utah Valley Express? Um, they had an opportunity for public art um, on the stations. The problem is UTA is not allowed to fund or choose the art. And so they asked a third party to step up and to run this. So I went to Mayor Curtis and I said, hey, we need to do this. So something that's got to happen. So he said, well, why don't you make an organization that takes care of it? And I said, OK. <laughs> so we've been working on this for about eight months. And in the end, the decision was made that each station was going to be represented by a different native plant. Um, downtown, there's a lot of cement, there's a lot of asphalt, there's a lot of sidewalk, there's a lot of lines of very geometric everything. And our initial plan was to um, take all the glass panels on the stations and to create wayfinding, a grid, but it was just a lot more lines. And so we wanted to introduce some more organic shapes. And most people who visit Utah, they come here so that they can go on some great hikes and explore the outdoors. And so we wanted to sort of represent that. So this is one. This is the, uh, the cactus pair. Um, and so one station is going to have this uh, rendition on each of the glass panels throughout. Um, they're going to be, we're handling the art on nine different stations. Um, and I just brought five of them. I'll show the next one. So this is going to be the Oak Station. I went around with a crew. For Doug, Doug volunteered two of his, uh, his men from Parks and Rec, and we drove around for four hours yeah, clipping branches and picking up leaves throughout all of Provo to get specimens we could photograph for this. So went up to the next one. And this is an Aspen Station. The Juniper. And then this one, they had a funny nickname for it. I don't remember this exact. I have it saved, but it was called a rabbit weed, I believe. Um, rabbit brush. Rabbit brush, sure. Um, so we have nine native ones that we chose. Um, I had no idea what an education process it would be to find out which things are actually native and which ones are not, because we don't want to look like fools um, in the end when we pick some other plant. Um, another one that we're uh, working on a lot, um, it's that Center Street Project one. So. One impression that we're trying to battle downtown is that there are vacancies. It's so frustrating when I visit with people and they talk about the vacancies downtown because the truth is we really don't have many. There are very few vacancies downtown. Now, the places that look vacant, 
I, I would love to walk downtown with you and answer your questions at some point because every one of them has a story. But um, this is to handle just one of those examples. Um, we have the tailor-made building. And on, on the east side of it, there's a big vacant space where the Rock Church used to be. That space is actually owned by Newskin. Newskin leases that space to the police department, but they don't have any reason to have a fancy display out front. So it looks vacant. This is one example of a space that's being utilized, but it looks crappy and it makes our downtown look vacant. It doesn't look pretty. And so uh, Dixon asked me to see what we could do to make it look prettier. So we went to Newskin, we got permission, and they're, they've given us some funding and some opportunity to beautify this space. So if we can scroll down a little, I'm not gonna go through each of these bullet points exactly, but the description is we're gonna have an interactive LED light display throughout there. So there's, a, there's a, an installation that's gonna take up about 70% of that storefront, and it's gonna have lights that can do different types of displays. They're called movies because they're animations. They'll be 30 seconds, I don't know if it's on here. We can jump to the next one. They're gonna be 30 seconds to a minute long, these animations. And the interactive nature, we're gonna preload uh, 30 or so little clips from different artists around. And they're gonna have a different word that you can come downtown and you can text to a Google Voice number that we're setting up. So you text this word and that word will activate that video. We're gonna allow this to be a part of our art stroll in the future so different artists can submit their videos and then their responsibility is to promote their code word. So if I made a video, I could say my code word is blowfish. And then people go downtown and they text it to this number while they're standing in front and it'll activate a little display. So we're actually gonna be walking through that space um, with our new skin representative uh, this afternoon to start measuring things out and purchasing the supplies for this installation. So this is just one, and let's keep going down. There's a couple uh, images. So these are just obviously very rough examples of how it's gonna be displayed. We're gonna have a, a bottom that we create and a rear wall that we create. And then the lights will be suspended throughout. And then the way that they are represented has everything to do with how you program the LEDs. Um, now, we don't want it to always be running and there's a crazy light show going on. So there's going to be obviously um, a still stage that'll just be some sort of maybe representation of a mountain line or it'll be the downtown Provo logo or just say Provo or something simple and generic that can be at the resting state. Um, and then it can be activated. Maybe we haven't decided a an interval, maybe every hour um, or when you text it. So that's part of the install. So that's, that's one example of what we're trying to do to bring some more, I guess, energy and cleaning up our downtown because a lot of the concerns that we receive, they're not factual, but they're impressions. Like the fact that this space is vacant. It's really not. And we just need to help people realize that there's a lot more going downtown than they, than they think. Um, the next one is the restaurant guide. Hopefully, all of you have seen our restaurant guides. Um, we create this guide to uh, distribute for our visitors that come downtown. And I've produced a bunch of these for you. We just finished these last week. So these have a map that covers just the downtown area. And they have little highlights for some of the local shops downtown. One thing we added in this uh, newest uh, rendition is there's a key in the bottom right-hand corner below the map. And this key indicates which places serve alcohol, um, which ones are open late, and which ones um, deliver. And then there's one other thing. I don't remember what it is. You see it. Um, not on the map. Oh, if it's not on the map. There are some that are outside of our little map. Let's do this. Um, so uh, we just finished this new one. Now we distribute probably 20,000 of these each year. Um, we just distributed 2,000 of them to the LTUE conference. It was the sci-fi book convention that came to downtown. And we just use it to let our visitors know where they can eat. Um, a lot of them, they want to know what's within walking distance. And this really helps kind of visualize that. If they're coming to New Skin to hang out or if they're coming to the convention center to hang out, or the Marriott to hang out, or maybe they're in town for something at the Cubby Center. That's where we distribute all of these. So each event, we'll distribute a few thousand of them, and we're gonna continue producing them until there's enough turnover, and we need to update the file with the new restaurants. So that's one that took us, I don't know, several weeks to work on, um, and uh, we just got it finished. 
Um, well, we have uh, we've hired an employee recently. Some of you are familiar with the history of DPI. I need to finish up, I think. But um, we uh, we've had really strong times and really weak times, and we've just tried to really clean up our budget so we can make sure we're as efficient as possible with our funding. And uh, so I made an enormous amount of financial cuts in in the previous year, and we've realized that we can comfortably hire an assistant. So we've hired McKay. I think she's wandering the building right now because I wanted to introduce you to her. Uh, but um, as soon as she shows up, I'll let you know. But she's um, the one that's really helped us organize some of the data for stuff like the restaurant guide and then the art stroll. The art stroll is um, an event that's been around for a really long time. But again, it's kind of ebbed and flowed. It's been strong and it's been weak. And um, we've done a lot in the past three months to really grow the art stroll. Um, we're excited because we've added six venues recently and we have three more that are going to come online next month. And the Art Stroll, if you're not familiar, we have different businesses throughout our downtown that feature local artists. They'll set up, they'll show their art, and they'll allow them to sell it. And it's just a little reception. Some businesses, they just set up for that night. Other businesses, they set up for the night, and then the art stays there for the whole month until the next artist shows up for the next month. Um, they're all a little bit different. Um, but the Art Stroll has done really well. Um, in our last board meeting, we heard some good news from, from BYU. They just said it's... It, the, the really exciting thing is the, the revitalization of this particular program, and it has such a broad appeal. This is anecdotal. I don't have any data that backs it up other than it appeals to um, the families. It appeals to those that are just dating, and every month they have another reason to come down to, to Provo, and they have just, you know, been spreading the word around by yeah, now this is going to be the last little thing we discussed. Mm -hmm. um, we want our organization to do a lot more than just put up pretty murals and run the art stroll and fill vacancies. But we're the voice that can advocate for policy change downtown. And so our hope is that we can bring the businesses together and sort of share a common interest that we can um, then voice to you to let you know how we feel about certain key issues. And one that you're all aware of is parking. Um, we got together on January 17th and we visited with, I didn't take a head count, probably 60 business owners downtown to voice our concerns about the parking problem and how do we think we can help solve this parking problem. So there's been a lot of discussion about paid parking. There's tons of pros and cons about it. And um, I'm gonna be totally transparent with you guys. When I went into this meeting with the business owners, I was in full support of the paid parking idea. And my intention was, hey, let's get everyone on board for paid parking. And let's produce a document so we can show city council. But in the discussion, a lot of what we realized is if we implement paid parking right now, it's not gonna work. It's not going to work because right now we're not properly enforcing our parking downtown. So you put a meter there and nobody cares. Just like right now, there's a sign that says two hours and nobody cares. So if that's going to be successful, we need enforcement to step up. That's what number one is here on the, on the summary. I know that you guys get lots of stuff to read. So the summary is on the first page and there's a couple more pages that go a little more in depth. But we're, these are what we want as a business community to happen before paid parking is considered. First, proper enforcement. Strategic times and strategic places for enforcement. Number two, proper wayfinding. The study that was done in 2015 showed that we only had between 40 and 60% of our stalls that were actually utilized downtown. The biggest issue that we have is that nobody knows where the available stalls are. There's a lot of parking structures or parking lots that are behind the businesses and people don't know how to find them. We've been talking about wayfinding. We kind of started to do some wayfinding downtown, but it didn't really get finished and it's not very consistent. So wayfinding needs to happen so that if there's suddenly a parking meter and you're a cheap student that doesn't want to pay for parking, how do you find the free stall? There needs to be proper signage that can direct them to that point. And the third thing are the agreements with the parking structures. The city owns the majority of the parking structures in the downtown but we've set up third party leases for people like the Marriott, Provo Town Square, uh, Wells Fargo, several, several other places to manage these parking structures. Unfortunately, they're not managed the same way. 
The signage is very poor and confusing. A lot of these parking structures are in breach of their contract regarding these leases. And now that we have someone to enforce these things, Matt Taylor, we want to give him the power to do it. Let's start enforcing these agreements so we can have proper signage. When you get to a parking structure, you know exactly why you're going in there, if they're gonna charge you and, and how you get out. You know, because we have some where you pay to get out. You have some that say you pay, but you actually don't. You have some that say there's no public parking, but there is, but you have to go in the place to get a token to get out of the structure. It's a mess. Before we do any paid parking downtown, these things need to be fixed. And our hope is that if we fix these things, maybe we don't need paid parking at all. So this document was um, endorsed by our board as how the downtown business group feels about parking. And I have gone around and collected signatures from all the businesses downtown. Um, we got a handful of pages here of the different businesses that have signed it. And before I hand it to you, I still have about 20 more to get. So I'm gonna run around and collect a few more, and then I'm gonna hand this over to you. Um, but our hope is that our organization can, can do a lot more than put flowers downtown. Um, we wanna be the group that does put flowers downtown and make it pretty and inviting. But we also wanna be the group that can help advocate for change in policy, because I know that you guys hear complaints from all ends of the spectrum. You have haters that get mad when they get tickets, and you have haters that get mad when tickets don't get written. And so this document hopefully can help you understand what we want as a business community as a whole, instead of hearing these outliers. So I didn't have a lot of questions. I know I don't know time-wise. Yeah. We're, we're gonna be real short here, Dave. Take a quick one here, but I go ahead. I just wanted to thank you for the creativity and the energy you brought to the <laughs> board and brought to this assignment. And I also like the idea of you uh, getting the business owners together and, and helping uh, helping us understand how they feel about some of these policy issues. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're glad to. We have a couple other ideas on our docket for other stuff we want to discuss. There's a, there's a whole different attitude, and you can feel it here tonight, today uh, from the downtown Global Inc. And it, uh, it's a change. I've had the opportunity to be involved with them through this change, and it is. A different spirit and they are really involving I think this was the vision in the beginning to involve as many businesses as possible and that was not being done it is now yeah and I'm grateful for the change that's happened we look forward to they've got to have something they want to be involved with and I think that right. I think that he's finding things that they do want to be involved with there's right. a lot more people that are involved in joining talk to us just yeah. real quick about membership yeah, so memberships increased significantly. Um, part of the problem we had in the past was the small businesses who are on a tight budget. They, they, they have one location. They The owner of the business works there themselves because they don't have enough funding to pay an employee. I can't go to them and say, hey, I want $1,000, you know, because what am I providing them? And so that was a huge part of the transition when I took over last year is what do we provide and how can we justify that cost? So um, we've been building that up. And in the past, it was, hey, pay us what you can. But that's a real nebulous, I mean, if it's pay, pay us what you can, where's the real value in your service? So we have raised the price and it's $500 for every small business. We have about 40 small businesses that have joined that were not a part of the program last year, or in 2016. Um, I'll say as well, BYU, like Julie mentioned, they've been a part of our program since the inception in 2011 but we've never received received financial support from their organization until this year. They're now one of our founding $10,000 donors and they pay $10,000 to help run our program each year. And I just got an email yesterday that PEG is gonna be our new one. So PEG developers are also gonna join for $10,000 and they're gonna be a part of our board as well. So we're getting a lot more excitement from these big organizations that really do care about our downtown. They're gonna help us fund certain things. Now, if I could put one more plug in real quick, it is we're doing a lot of public art downtown. Because when you come to a downtown, the energy that you feel, it's not, it's not the coffee shop or the new skin or the whatever you see, but it's what kind of fills the gaps in between them. It's what do the sidewalks look like? You know, what sort are, are there murals downtown? What is the public transit like or the bike racks? And those are the things that we're trying to help create to just fill in those gaps to really create a feeling in the downtown so it's a desirable place that you don't go there for one business specifically, but you go there because it's a place that you want to be. Now, I say that again because we're 
grateful for the support we've received so far, but it would be wonderful if we had a good avenue to get access to the Rat Pack's funding for some of these public art opportunities downtown. Um, we have a mural that's gonna go up on the 1st of, of April that we're working with a class at BYU. They've organized a way to, to, they're reaching out to some of the underserved populations, the homeless community, um, the, the RA, the adult handicapped group, and several other of these groups, and they're all submitting what they believe home is. What is home to them? And they're taking these ideas and putting them into a mural that we're applying down at the startup building. Things like this, we occasionally need funding for. Um, and I know that I know that the city's working on that, but it's not done yet, and, and we'd love to find out how to get access to that funding. Thank you, Quinn. Yep. We'll, we'll be talking. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now move on to item number three, a presentation on the Parks and Recreation Department potential budget requests. Ready. All right. Parks and Recreation Department wants to thank the council for this opportunity as a pre-discussion. Uh, so I am Scott Harrison, Director of Parks and Recreation, joined by Doug Robbins, Assistant Director, as part of the presentation. Bruce Snow, who is on our park board. Brent Edgington, who is also on our Parks and Recreation board. Kari Van Wagner, our Executive Assistant with Parks and Recreation. Bryce Merrill, Rec Center Manager, and Jake Drzaich, who is our Peaks Manager. Thomas McKenna is in the back as our Projects Manager. Oh, thank you. So great opportunity to have a pre-discussion. This is something for not only for you to give an idea of what's coming from Parks and Recreation, but for us to hear you. I also see Brett Watson just came in, our Manager of the Golf Course. So this isn't just a clip art. This is Parks and Recreation. We have a very diverse, big department with a lot of different functions in our areas. And we're, there's no budget presentation can happen without going through all these areas. So we're going to move really quick as we fly through these things. It's important to know what's unique about Provo Parks and Recreation because it is really part of our budget process. We are not a required service. We are not like a utility where you wake up and you buy your electricity from a certain person every day. Everything about us is voluntary service and they select us every single day. We've shown that between at the rec center between one out of every four or five in our community is a member of our recreation center. So we are seeing inclusion rates in the city where they are taking us into their lifestyle that are unprecedented in our industry. We have had two elections supporting our department initiatives and our citywide initiatives, and both of those resulted in a tax increase. One was the rec center and one was the wrap tax. Both of those had overwhelming support for our citizens. So that shows what they feel about these quality of life issues in our family friendly environment. Every single day we open our doors, 30,000 people comes to, come to our parks, <coughs> trails, rec center, ice arenas, cubby centers, golf courses. So our inclusion on a daily basis is a major event. Yet, hopefully the mayor's office will tell you this, and I can tell you for ours, not too many complaints come in about our department. We have a high satisfaction rate. We do really operate under the idea that our citizens deserve the very best in parks and recreation services and that is something that we talk about all the time. Provo citizens seem to react to new and quality facilities. You've seen what they've done at the rec center, you've seen what they did with the splash pad at Pioneer Park. Our citizens enjoy these amenities in, the, in our community and they use them. We're a an efficient department and an effective department with this participation. We really talk about a lot about increasing our use and through that success story, decreasing our subsidies. So in that sense, we do not see ourselves as someone coming here at, with our handout asking for money in a budget process. We try to come and be part of the solution as we go through this. 
So I know my entertainment value. So that's why Doug Robbins is going to take part of the presentation. Then I'll come back and pick up some of the last slides. So Doug's going to take a few as we go through our department budgets. And I wish I, I should channel my inner Quinn Peterson. Get a little energy to my presentation. But, uh, uh, first uh, area a program unit that we'd like to discuss is our parks and grounds. Uh, some of the unique features are our traditionally high rates of resident satisfaction. In our latest uh, master plan survey of the community that was done by an outside uh, uh, management firm, they found that over that 91% of all residents that surveyed found that our grounds at our city parks trails and recreation facilities were either good or in excellent condition. Um, that is, uh, our, our consultant let us know that, that in all the years they've been doing those type of surveys, those were the highest scores they've ever seen. And they didn't have a single respondent come back with a, with a, uh, a grade that was, uh, that was poor. So we really look at that as our job is to maintain, uh, as part of our stewardship of these public grounds and these, these important areas, maintain these these high quality facilities at the rate that we have been in the past that we feel uh, adds to the quality of life here in Crow and helps us uh, achieve these livability uh, ratings that we were, were so common to receive. Um, again, we like to uh, resolve issues wherever we can. Uh, some of those some of those solutions uh, come through our sustainability program. And a recent one was where we took uh, some interdepartmental savings and went through the entire uh, facility inventory and switched out as many of the old uh, lighting systems as we could possibly find and uh, transition those to LED in order to save energy costs to uh, you know roll those forward so that we can cover larger acreages uh, without asking for more of the budgetary funding. Same thing with the ir central irrigation system controls. We've upgraded those with in, uh, internal department savings so that uh, we can conserve water and also water rates as well that we're paying. Uh, we also partner with uh, Public Works wherever we can. A uh, recent example of that is Kiwanis Park where we're able to uh, take a, a, a field and working with them also multi-use it as a uh, storm retention uh, facility as well. Uh, one example of one that we're really looking uh, at right now very closely is trying to fund a full-time labor within our city uh, our city appropriation to handle uh, some of these expanded duties. Uh, new facilities uh, such as BRT landscaping, the 300 South Trail, Lakeview Parkway, Bulldog Boulevard, the plants that are under design, usually uh, projects that are outside parks and recreation major focus. Uh, those sometimes we need to be a little bit more vigilant making sure that uh, maintenance funding gets uh, covered for those as, as the city absorbs those. Uh, oftentimes we do the civil engineering but we need to make sure that if there's grounds associated with those, that those are also funded so that those don't water down our parks and recreation maintenance, uh, maintenance of our facilities, parks and recreation. Another example is the Grandview Hill site, working with the neighbor, neighborhood there and uh, partnering with them to improve something that is important to them, that site. Here we go, cemetery. Uh, the status of the expansion project, the lawn interment sections have all been completed and they're open. The cremation garden is now open and we're uh, 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 conducting sales on both of those sites. Uh, the mausoleum has gone out to bid uh, with the increasing construction costs uh, that we've all been seeing. Uh, it's gone out a couple of times and we're, we're struggling trying to get that to come in within budget. So again, uh, a creative approach is to relook at that opportunity, maybe scale it back. Uh, change it so that in some ways it will fit within budget, maybe incorporate more of the, the cremation elements and niche uh, spaces as well to fit that within budget, but it has not been constructed yet. It's very popular. Uh, uh, the new expansion site, our sales and revenues are up. They're exceeding our, our expectations. Uh, as you see from this ch chart here, uh, these are national standards from uh, the National Foundation of uh, Funeral Directors, I believe. But it shows that uh, cremation right now in 2008 is pretty much uh, as popular as lawn interments, and we expect that to kind of shift and cremations to be more popular. So we feel like we're ahead of the curve on that one. We'd like to 
do what we can to make sure that this site serves the, the needs of the public for at least another 25 years and maybe even beyond with some creative uh, solutions going forward. But I would also like to thank the Municipal, Municipal Council for supporting that revenue bond uh, that made this uh, made this possible. It's really changed the way uh, we operate here at, at the cemetery. Um, right now, we are having a question with the with the sales up. Mm -hmm. Is that affect the bond? That, that's something we really need to kind of we need to talk about. Uh, those sales that are coming in right now will be we kind of feel that there will be a surge and that they'll kind of plane out at some point and kind of level out. It gives us an opportunity to utilize those surplus funds to maybe pay down the bond. Uh, a little bit early or uh, you know fund the perpetual maintenance uh, fund for when this is all built out in, in a few decades. John? The thing I would add too and it was kind of anticipated that if we have you know, as we have sales a little stronger we'll set we set aside a certain percentage to go towards the bonds and a certain part of our operations so that additional money will be set aside so for some reason down the road uh, revenue cap is held off a little bit we'll have some additional reserves to service those bonds. Uh, projects. Uh, we have a great projects team right now. In fact, we've got the best we've ever had. We've got some unique skill sets right now with the staff we have out on, on our project sites that we've never been able to experience before. And they, that is really giving us some efficiencies that we're experiencing, especially in concrete uh, concrete uh, construction. We're seeing uh, cost savings elements of 50 to 70 percent because of the expertise that we currently have with staff. So we'd like to keep that rolling and, and use that creative approach, uh, you know, the pay-as-you-go uh, type approach on, on, these, on these projects. Um, some of the efficiencies, um, we just feel that uh, with these internal, internal uh, ex experience and skill sets, we're able to get a whole lot more done. With construction costs going up, the expectations of the public certainly haven't gone down, and so we're going to have to get quite creative in how we approach this, and we think that... Uh, uh, on every project, as, as we as we assess opportunities, we're able to really see some efficiencies. Some of the capital projects we have ongoing right now: Spring Creek Park. Uh, we expect to open that park in the fall of 2018. The Provo River Trail uh, renovation. Uh, we're receiving bids right now and, and analyzing those. Should be starting that sometime this summer. The first phase. Uh, the adaptive playground, uh, utilizing some CDBG funding. Uh, depending on how funding uh, comes in, we hope to start that this summer and have it completed by next summer uh, for an opening. And it all involves, uh, you know, a thorough review of our CIP. We've put together a plan that uh, we'll have an opportunity to review in a few minutes. But, uh, of course, those those priorities and sequencing of those projects can be adjusted. Uh, we do recognize that we have an opportunity right now with proper supervision in the field we really feel that we will be able to really maximize the available funding and stretch out uh, those funding opportunities as far as we possible. Can I ask about that? Just help sure. me understand that. You feel that if we, we put money into a field supervisor that would actually save us money over? Our costs, our costs are quite a bit lower. We don't have a profit margin. And a lot of these costs are going up so fast right now. Uh, you know, the opportunity, the, the value of the dollar just isn't what it was even three months ago. We're seeing it climb that fast. So we feel like with this in-house expertise, we can have internal staff, which is uh, a much lower cost to these projects. Where's the most inflation happening? I, I think it's a lot of it's in materials. I don't know if it's in labor right now. It's, it's both material, material cost. and labor. It's uh, in the last two years, we've seen upwards of 15 to 30 percent increase just in uh, in material and labors in labor. So it's it's uh, and it's we don't see we don't see much difference when the forecasts really are saying it's going to continue. Uh, we don't see a downturn. Okay, some other grounds and green areas. Uh, we have a weed bait program. We have a crew that goes out and, and handles uh, uh, weed issues on city properties that isn't necessarily a parks and recreation issue, but since we have that expertise internally with our tree crews, we attach that to that operation and we provide that for the city as well. Uh, again, this boulevard right-of-way landscaping, a lot of our new roads uh, that has associated landscaping that's included. We do snow removal during winter months. We found it was much more efficient than it would be to contract that out. 
uh, because we have staff that we retain through the winter, even though we lay off two thirds of our staff. Uh, on a seasonal basis, we do have some of the routine that handles the snow removal at the municipal center, the police station, fire, all the fire stations, making sure that the trucks can get in and out of the libraries, the library, uh, the downtown center street business district. And then we get to all of our parks and recreation sites after that. So these other grounds responsibilities are increasing. We just need to keep an eye on that and make sure that uh, we're using volunteer services wherever possible and that we uh, Keep an eye on some of these external projects that are coming in. An example uh, here is the Bulldog Boulevard design. We heard that there was an expectation that Parks and Recreation would be plowing the individual uh, bike lanes that are, I think, six feet wide. Um, right now, we we haven't got that funded, or, and so we would have to kind of coordinate with Pulverse to make sure that we coordinate that. Right. Working through some of the remainders, talking about these characteristics to these budget. Covey Center um, is another example of a high use facility. It's established itself as theatrical, uh, in as a theatrical producer, and also has expanded its gallery spaces to multi level. And we have found that this diversity of program is something that we find as a success in all of our recreation facilities. Covey Center, even with these high numbers that is built up, it operates at less full-time staff than when we, when we opened it over 10 years ago. Um, we have, do have a focus on revenue production, which sometimes revenue production and the arts don't exactly go together, but we've been able to put a business model to the Covey Center. We did a benchmark of art centers um, with similar amenities. Um, west of the Mississippi noted that most subsidies are over $1 million right now are our subsidies about at 400,000, which is dropped from 750,000 when we first opened. So we're pretty proud of that. A need that may be coming forward is we're finding it hard to hire our technical production staff, the sound and lights people for our for all these productions. Um, so we may have to match the existing market in that area, and we're looking for ways to get that and come up with an idea for that. Special events, um, we're not just a municipal Easter egg hunt department anymore. We have creative ideas and current trends. Um, we're, we have gone from just in the time that I've been with Provo Parks and Recreation about six years, we've gone to hundreds of people attending to now thousands of people attending. We're even selling out municipal events, which is unheard of, which is a great level of popularity. And we're not doing the same thing year after year. We're going with current trends and what's exciting and what is new. And we're becoming very, very good at running large scale events. University interns are the major labor force. And let me throw in, they're also unpaid. And they are supporting all of our events and doing a lot of the work with us, with our staff. Um, we are even able to charge admission to things like events like Science Palooza and events like our Halloween Carnival, which back in when we were starting to do that seemed like heresy in the world of parks and recreation. But our quality is so high that people are willing to pay their dollars towards a quality event. Some needs, and I hope we all understand, bigger events and more people means more materials and more supplies and, and more people. So we'll be looking at this budget to talk about moving a seasonal employee to part-time regular to handle these events throughout the year and give some paid, assist, paid staff assistance. Our sports, we run some of the largest youth and adult sports in the region. We, these are big programs. We want this to be a successful interaction in sports. So we prepare kids for sports and in skill development so they have a good time. We understand that experience-based design goes towards facilities and programs, and our field of dreams is a great example of that. It's a small field just off the rec center where we have um, scaled down a football field, a soccer field, and a baseball field so kids can get the experience of playing on a field and feel that they're part of something and it's scaled to them and that size so they're able to have the experience. We're seeing trends up. In, the, in our participation, not only in soccer, which we just experienced, but also across the other areas and other sports. We have efficiency in that we now have a rec center with four gyms, and a lot of our sports can happen in one site. That means one supervisor. 
that can handle all these areas while we're doing this instead of being spread out amongst eight other spots. Every program is priced on a goal of 125% rate of return. So it not only covers its cost, but helps cover the administration of that program. We are constantly looking at sports trends to see what we can expand into. We always are looking at our existing facilities, the balance between our programs, which are the largest, and some other programs that utilize our fields in the area. We're, we're utilizing technology to communicate to our parents so they're able to get one download and they've got their schedule of youth soccer games on their calendar in their schedule and they're not having to hunt and find and look for a piece of paper on a schedule. We are running out of fields. There are kids in Provo that cannot play because we do not have enough sports fields for them in our programs and in all the competitive and or bantam programs, whichever you call them. So we need to talk about building more fields in Provo. So hopefully some ideas will be coming on that. Quick question. Yes. That, that 26, 27% increase in, in soccer, is that over, year over year? That, that's just compared to 2016? Or that's that one year, that's what we experienced this year. What, what would you attribute that? I mean, if, if we hit, if we were just inaugurating our, our regional sports complex, I could imagine numbers like that, but what changed between 2016 and 2017? Other than quality management, I think, you know, there are times budget downturns and those things can affect programs. And I think we are seeing that research back. I think when we were going through tougher budgets or tougher ec economic times, we saw a little bit of a dip. So I, I think we see this coming back now. And I think we have made some major changes in our soccer program to really start to move toward how is the best soccer program run? And we've made some of those changes in how much they practice, the type of uniforms they wear, how is it managed, and those type of things. And I think people are recognizing that quality. It's remarkable. Might be my impact, but people don't even football. Mm -hmm. And soccer's hot. It definitely is the hot sport. It's the beautiful game, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about a recreation center. I feel safe in saying this. We run the most successful recreation center in the United States. Two million people come to our rec center every single year. So to cover again how what this does financially, the rec center covers its operational costs, contributes 500000 to the general fund, and puts away $400,000 annually to cover any future needs it may have for this facility. There's no other, there's no other facility that can tell that type of story. So efficiency wise, we're well over our operation costs. Um, Bryce developed an app which over 15,000 transactions where people reserve their child watch, reserve their fitness program, reserve their racquetball court. So now all these people are not all calling in to the rec center and requiring a staff member to take that phone call. That helps us reduce our staff and be efficient that way. We have worked on, in a 162,000 square foot facility, we work on utility efficiencies all the time and have seen some great numbers in there that reducing our natural gas and our energy use. Sorry, Travis. You had to come for that part, didn't you? <laughs> An important part of this, one dynamic big facility, one staff. You know, we're not a bunch of small facilities, niche programming. This is a one, stop place for our recreation needs in Provo and we staff it with one staff and that helps create that efficiency too. More So our needs, more customer, needs more staff, more maintenance, more supplies. Somebody's got to work child watch and all these elements. And Bryce may be running the most successful rec center in the United States, but in our department, he is probably facing our big, big, biggest budget crisis in that these extra revenues that he bring in have in the past not translated into additional operating dollars to help keep this success story going. So we will be coming forward with solutions and ideas and with revenues to come up with ideas that we can cover this ever increasing membership that we have. Five years we've been operating, we have never had a year where we've been down in memberships. We are still on our growth period. That blows away any curve that any other rec centers ever seen in participation. 
really is important that we keep our investing in success because we don't know what our ceiling is on this place. Peaks Ice Arena, it's unique. It's a former Olympic venue. How many communities have one of those? It is, we have gone when we first took this over from private management, from being the worst in the state to now everybody wants to hold their event there. Our public open skating is one third of our total revenue. So this is people skating in circles at our ice arena and it generates over $400,000 and any other arena in the state is somewhere at about a quarter of that. So our, our public use of this facility, not just by our hockey players and our figure skaters, is absolutely tremendous. And our connection to BYU is amazing. And we were able to do a conversion not too long ago of ice and turf combination to where in those areas where the bleachers were for the Olympics, we put those into indoor turf. And that generates about a quarter million dollars of revenue every single year, which helped in getting the subsidy reduction down to where we're at. Efficiency, here's that comparable. The, I think the Kearns Ice Oval, another Olympic venue, is two sheets and very comparable. Right now, they see, receive a $1.5 million subsidy to operate their facility. Right now, our facility has an operational subsidy of $100,000. Things we need, we need to solve this issue with the, who's going to manage this place and get this done with the city and county. There's a lot of exciting things to be done in the future. We don't need this uncertainty amongst our user group and amongst our citizens, we need to get this solved and then move forward and, and create our new success story. When Jake, who is here, our manager, when that many people show up for public skating and we have the tiny front counter that we do now, we, we are not set up for the numbers that we have. We need to change how people enter the facility and what type of front desk that they enter and what controls they go to. Let's talk about the East Bay Golf Course, another high use, high demand facility. Highest played public golf course in Utah. Unique, it includes a par three and a championship course. And unique in it has extensive connections to our local universities. These kids are all over the place in utilizing this facility. Efficiency, we hardly use any culinary water and have almost a zero color. Basically it's to run our bathroom is what our culinary water bill is. Because all of our irrigation water comes from the sewage treatment plant, the gray water that comes from there. That is a huge efficiency element that that site has. And that's what is a big part of our success story there. We can accommodate everyone, no matter what skill level. Our facility is known for quicker rounds and faster playability. Our need here is that we need a, a position to assist right now, Brett Watson, who's in the back, that golf course is open dawn to dusk. He's our one full-time guy in the clubhouse. So as efficient as Parks and Recreation wants to be, we don't want to operate a sweatshop. You know, we want to be realistic in our expectations and we would like to put forth a recommendation for a coordinator level position to assist in the clubhouse and we have ideas of funding that internally too. So we not only come with a problem, but we come with a solution too. We'll also be bringing forth now that we have the design that we'll be starting soon for the three holes to mitigate the medical school three holes. We have um, studies for master planning those three holes into and master planning our golf course and also the mountain course that we'll be bringing forward too, to have these answers questioned for the future if this ever comes up again. So that's not everything. There's, we have a lot of specifics that we need to nail down, but I think what the council can expect is that we will be bringing a concept to you as part of the budget process, working through administration. And this has been something that has been pushed and supported by administration that we're gonna revolutionize our delivery of efficient, highly used parks and recreation services with ideas to become even more efficient and even more highly used by our citizens. That's it. Thank you. Can we clap? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, and when do we expect to see that revolutionary new budgeting sort of thing? When will it be coming? It's coming. We've talked about it and 
mayor's working really hard at clearing the path on some of those um, elements that are still in the air right now. And that's what it's really about. You know, we've got to nail down some things and she's been absolutely supportive from the start of the concept to right now in really clearing the path so we can do something that, you know, makes us even more unique compared to our neighbors. That's a mouthful of what you've just done, presented to the council, and it's a lot of work, and we appreciate it. Scott, would you, you've introduced board members. Thank you for being here. Is there anything you'd like to add or talk about today? I just, I can't say enough about these gentlemen that run this program. They're, they're exceptional. I, I've worked for Intermountain Healthcare for 30 plus years, and, and we've got nothing on you in terms of running organizations and people. These people are exceptional. Kudos to them. They're very transparent in everything we do, and it's it's a pleasure and honor to work with them. Could I just say one reason very quickly? Uh, just an interesting thing. I I hope that uh, Rock Canyon Park that we're using right, certain types of funds to do we do those pavilions, rat tax funds. We are right. Because I have a, we, I had two constituents call me and said, "I see you're doing this, uh, these pavilions over in Rock Canyon. Is that the tax that I voted against Costco because they give all of their taxes to Orem?" And I thought, "What is she talking about?" <laughs> then I realized they go to Orem. That was a little discussion we had on the wrap tax, and she is so supportive of that. But she noticed that the upkeep of that. Rat tax, and then one other family. Uh, Scott, are we getting those plaques on the things that the rat tax is doing? Have we got those plaques in place? Yeah, everything that the our rat tax will be associated with, and Doug was instrumental in putting this program together. We'll have an identification, so as we're doing these projects, everybody will know what they have funded by voting for this tax. And Rock Canyon is included yeah. as one of those. I, I told her that I thought it was. Yeah, you were right. And, and finally. Um, uh, one family told me that they are, they usually go to Orlando for a family reunion, but when they get to Orlando, everybody never sticks around. They go to Disneyland and all these other places, so they've decided to hold it in Provo this year and go to the rec center. Nice. I just think that I just think the rec center and the <laughs> This well, change it to now we're better than Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> new hashtag, huh? Yeah. What Orlando always wanted to become. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Scott? Okay. Um, so back on the cemetery, we know how many plots and then what's the going price? Doug, what, what is the availability of the new area? Right now, it's all open. I don't know individual uh, prices for the plots, but the capacity is, I think, there are 13,000 available spaces. And it's, it should take care of us for the next 25 years when we're looking at it now. If we're able to add some more cremation spaces and niche spaces like that, it might even extend for 35 years. I'll send you our price. Yeah, if we can yeah. send you that. All right. I should know that. What's the latest update on the Rock Canyon master plan and some of that? I, I, I'm a little bit less in, in contact, so I'm not quite sure yeah. what the latest Our design is. committee still meeting, okay. and we're, we're nearing the end of the master plan review of that document. Should be back to this this group to report on that. Okay. that effort. So, so it's kind of a refinement now and then tackling some of the um, use issues yeah. and maybe some of the strategies and ideas that are coming from that group. On, on how to address some of the, the issues that we have, you know, based on, you know, dogs and and some of the other elements and fires and what is going to be our policy on those types of things. Is there, um, current, I, it's, I've been getting reports that they're currently start, starting to try to enforce the dog on leashes in the mouth of the canyon. Is yeah, that? We've met the Provo PD and animal okay. control. And, They've offered to help us out there as well. Okay. We're signing it a little more clearly and plans for those elements. Yeah. So at least from that standpoint, we can make sure that we're taking care of the land that we're a steward over. I just want to say thank you for everything. I think, um, you know, I, I, I've, 
I think, I, I think Provo should take great pride in its identification. I think I think what you do gives Provo an identity and a character that's really central to who we are and what people love about living here. And and I just think it's fabulous. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in. Um, as we get these budgeting things that are going to be coming forward, you'll be able to tie a lot of these things together. And if you have questions, these guys are more than available to answer those. We'll now move on to um, item number four, a presentation on the fighter capital improvement plan with Dustin. Well, council members, um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at the capital improvement packet. Um, it is a hefty document, a little over 170 pages, um, but I'll, I'll be reviewing just the high level um, contents of it, just going through some of those summaries and pointing out some of the new projects and some of the discussion points that the council might want to address with regard to this packet. Um, for informational purposes, I'll be going through on page two, there is a using this document um, there, there isn't any major changes to this over prior years, but we, over the past few years, we've made it, these changes to try and aid in the communication that this divide, this uh, packet provides to the council and to the public. So, projects are separated into either funded, partially funded, or unfunded statuses to indicate um, our our ability to perform those those tasks. Priority codes are um, our effort to try and communicate how urgent the need is for each of those priorities, with one being the highest and three being the lowest. Um, the, the two caveats on the necessary infrastructure item two are C and D. C being conditional funding that we have a, a reasonable belief that we, we have this funding available, but should that funding be lost, then we, we wouldn't do the project. And D is more along the lines of this would be only if we were to secure an outside funding source. It would depend entirely on our ability to secure those outside funds. Last year, we added this operating impact indicator. So each project is given a rating of A, B, C, or D. This is because many of the costs associated with projects are difficult to quantify, but it's easier for us to know whether this is going to have a positive effect on our operating budget. It's going to produce efficiencies, which is what an A would be. B would be that it would have no impact. You know, it's kind of a status quo project. A C being that eventually this is going to have upward pressure. A good example that you just heard is that when we when we build new um, parking strips that we have to maintain, there is an upward pressure on the park's maintenance staff to be able to do that. And they might be able to absorb it for a time, but given enough C's, we will need to add operating dollars to support those types of operations. And D would be a project that if we were to do it now, we would need additional funding. For instance, if we were to build a new fire station that we haven't had in the past, those are new dollars that would have to be allocated to the maintenance of that building in addition to the actual construction itself. Um, so one thing that we did add this year at request of the council is I've identified which projects are new compared to last year's CIP packet by adding an asterisk to those projects. So we'll, we'll just jump right into the summary. So on page four is the airport capital improvement summary. Um, you'll notice that none of these are new projects. Um, I Generally, I differentiated new projects by things that had either major funding changes or were entirely new additions, but there are some minor changes that I felt like weren't material enough to, to warrant highlighting those changes. Um, and so if the council has any questions on any of these things, feel free to stop me. The other directors are here. They'll be available to answer specific questions that you might have about individual projects. Um, but on the next page, actually, is probably where we'd want to discuss um, if the council is interested on um, some of these other other items that are unfunded, right? The idea of are we going to build a terminal in Provo? And that would depend on if we were to secure outside funding and there would be a match. And there are some questions related to that that we would have to solve over the next fiscal year. Another one is the, the UVU parking lot. And I think we're, we're considering ways of funding that. And I think a lot of, a lot of what's in included and a lot of the considerations in this packet are more of there, there are issues that we're tackling, that we're dealing with, and, and things that are, are currently being discussed and more continued discussion. And, and these things are no exception to that. 
Why is it called UV Porta? Because that's so dirty. It, um, Dave, you can correct me, but I believe that UVU is a heavy utilizer of the airport through their flight school, right. and and it's related, I think, to the parking for their needs there. And I just Dustin, there was a, um, there's an extension of a corporate taxiway that had been planned on the airport master plan. UVU had been using that area for the park for their parking lot, and they knew when when UVU occupied that building, they knew eventually a corporate taxiway would would take out the parking lot, and so um, about half of that corporate taxiway is being extended and built right now um, by TAC Air. And so it required UVU to build a new uh, parking lot. And, and, and the costs that are shown here are actually relocations of utilities that are in that same corporate taxiway. So you would be building a lot of utility issues. Yeah. Sewer water that's in the parking lot has to be relocated. Um, page 15 is the next department. This is the energy department. Um, there are no major additions to their projects. Some of these projects are do have changes within them um, based on current needs for energy infrastructure, but largely um, many of these are status quo projects. And Travis, I don't know if there's anything that you would highlight that might stand up to the council. Um, one of the bigger projects we're doing is a new substation on 9th East over by BYU. It's a new, uh, creates a ring bus for um, more reliability. That's one of the bigger projects that are, is going on next year. But if there are no questions, um, we'll move on to the engineering fund. Um, this is page 36. Page 36 only has one new project. That's the Nevada Avenue path um, in the current fiscal or in the proposed fiscal 19. Um, there are some unfunded projects as well that, that aren't new, but on the next page, on page 37, discussions around um, the potential need for a bridge, whether or not it's located at that, that location or some of these other items. And again, these are items that we're working on, uh, trying to identify funding or, or that we think that these are things that we're just trying to inform you that we will have to tackle issues related to these in, in coming years. This one is 2122. Are you serious that we might consider $42 million? On, so you're, you're talking about, um, yeah, so that, that year. So we this, this $22 million price tag, you'll notice is a 2D. What that means is I think it's very unlikely that we will bond for $22 million to build, build a bridge. What is more likely is that we'll receive some UDOT funding. There will be a local match requirement and that we will have to tackle you know, a, a, a large project like that from many different angles. So this isn't this isn't saying this is how much we have to front, but this is the size of the projects that are coming down the pike, and um, there is a need for an additional crossing outside of that University um, Avenue crossing. So again, this is just our our way of communicating to you some of the things that the departments are aware of that are issues that are out there, but this these priority levels are our attempt to communicate to you. So really, what if I were a council member? I would be most concerned if there were ones that were unfunded, right? These are things that we absolutely must do. Um, whereas two D's and C's in particular are, are we're working on making sure that these things happen, but we're not as concerned about the timing and, um, and, and the details are still being worked out on how, how we might tackle those issues. Related to number eight, that $22 million project, we flip to page 42. Go ahead, Kelsey. So this is a, a public works engineering study on, oh, okay, uh, on, on where that bridge makes the most sense, whether that's Freedom or whether that's 500 West. Um, I think this is something that we've had discussions on in the past. I, I had them on the, the TMAC in, in particular. Um, the school district has brought this um, this up to us, the train crossing near Franklin Elementary School. Um, I believe somewhere in there it talks about uh, this, towards the end of that paragraph, that the city desires to complete a study to determine if an overpass at either of these locations will significantly alleviate some of the impacts of traffic safety concerns that are currently pre present. Um, 
and then the, the study to determine the best location for, for an overpass. Uh, with the train, we, we have talked, at least in the past, um, about measuring, uh, oh, sorry, struggling with the words today, about uh, monitoring that these trains crossings and finding out what's the frequency of blockage, what's the duration of, of these blockages. Um, and I didn't know if that has occurred or if that would be part of the study. We've done some work okay. in that regard. We do have a, a radar device that monitors uh, that area. But again, as you suggested, uh, location is going to be really critical. The other component is that we anticipate at some point in the next couple of years, we will see the uh, value of a Tiger Grant that we jointly applied for with uh, UTA and MAG uh, that, would, that would fund a pedestrian bridge at this location. And one of the key questions would be does that, does, does increasing pedestrian safety at this location suggest it might be smarter to move the vehicle bridge further away? Um, and so again, I think as a part of that analysis, we'll look at what's likely impact of the pedestrian bridge and how would that maybe modify our thoughts about a location for a vehicle bridge. So, so again, I think that's all to be considered in this, uh, in this upcoming study. I, I do like how that's written, that, that you know, determine if it's, if it's necessary, $22 million, you know, even with, with other grants or whatever, that's, that's significant. And, yeah. and if there's a way to do it without, I mean, and, and overpasses have impacts on the surrounding area. No question about it. Community, so. You can put homes in the shade that to never recover, and yeah, we've seen that happen a lot of overpass sites around the state. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Question? Page 42, you have the Nevada project. Is that what we presented here? Yes. Can we go ahead with that now? Yeah, we're in the process. Well, we're in we're in the process of trying to define the uh, uh, whether or not we can actually acquire the property, and that's been a little bit of a question. We are in the process of doing that, so we haven't come back to you yet with the final, with the appropriation for the property acquisition. But this would be additional property acquisition as well as uh, construction of the little side path on Nevada Avenue. Positive. Uh, so far, it's been positive, although. Again, we've got quite a number of property owners to talk to, and some some are, are happy to donate, some are not. Uh, generally speaking, once you buy right of way, those who used to be happy to donate are no longer happy to donate, and, uh, and you would expect that. So, so again, we will certainly have some work to do there, but again, this is for next fiscal year, so we're anticipating it'd be, if we were gonna, going to get under construction, it'd be next summer, year from now. And there's only a few of these that I have comments on, so no problem. <laughs> I won't be taking that much time. Um, I, I think this is a good example of, of where I see some of the greatest value in um, priority-based budgeting, where we, we look at lots of different things and, and how to how to compare. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of the, the Grand View Hill um, beautification project mm -hmm. that that uh, parks seem to be pushing ahead with and, and, and making plans. Um, things like that generally before might have, or my impression at least, is, is that some of these kind of park improvements have been uh, handled through uh, neighborhood matching grants that, that we've done. And the idea as well, you know, the, 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 the Grandview Hill one is it's so much more expensive, it can't really be handled right. under, under there. But if you look at what um, the River Grove neighborhood mm -hmm. has done, uh, you know, over years and years and lots of, you know, they, they slowly transformed Lions Park. Um, and I think a lot of neighborhoods would love the kind of budget that that, that uh, Grandview Hill beautification is looking at. Um, and so it's, it's hard to say without balancing all of the other things, that, you know, looking at it in isolation, it, it's hard to say, you know, why, why, why would we fund this over some other things? Anyway, so um, and and I, I have the same kind of questions on, on this. Is, is this, how, how does this compare to all of the other priorities in, in the city? And, and why I think budgeting for outcomes would be helpful. Well, I think uh, the difference on Nevada is it's not being done for uh, the beauty, it's being done for the safety. Um, just like our other rec center where we were looking at the crosswalks, uh, this has no safety at all. It's just 20 feet of asphalt that people walk with the cars. 
and they go 40 miles an hour. We have talked about some heat seeking missiles along Nevada Avenue just to stop that speed problem. So. <laughs> Um, the next department is the general CIP on page 54. Um, so there is some items on this list. This, these are only unfunded projects. Um, that is only partially true for some of these projects, um, particularly these ones at the bottom that are bold and italicized. Um, so the first project is station station two is what it should actually read, and I apologize for that. Um, 22 is the countywide designation, but it's our station. Two. Right, it's our station. Page two. again. So this is this is page 54, um, and so so we feel like this is a critical <coughs> item. It's one that we are working on how to tackle it, but we haven't yet. We aren't yet ready to come to you with a solution to this item. Um, some of these other items are related to infrastructure improvements on on this complex um, it, it it begs the question that how much of these are worth it um, so the ones that we've included here in the next fiscal year these two items are actually items that we could take with us were we to leave this city center so it makes sense to invest in them now and that for we can salvage a large chunk of those those projects but as we get out into these other years these costs um, might may need to be evaluated on whether or not we, we choose to do that. So, John is here to answer any questions you might have on those projects. I would also add that, that what we're proposing to do with those two projects listed there, I believe, is that we have our uh, our replacement fund for our systems and equipment that we've, we've adopted, and we plan on just using those funds, which we're it's about 395. Yeah, about 395,000 uh, for the general fund maintenance funds that we're continuing. They're we'll designed to replace those. those kind of systems, so we would just use those dollars for that. Yeah. But we wanted to be transparent and share this with the council and make sure that they kind of understood our plan. Right. Uh, the next department is on page 71. It's the parks department. Um, there um, is only one additional project in here, and I think it's mostly just a, a tweak to some of the funding. The downtown streetscape has had some adjustments to it, um, but the, the majority of the projects that you may want to discuss are on the next page, the partially funded projects. Um, you heard Scott address some of these specifically, the need for a regional sports complex, the adaptive playground, and Slate Canyon Park. That to playground, I believe, is contingent on CDBG funds, which is why it's not it's not on the funded status yet because those aren't guaranteed. Um, the regional sports complex, there are some complexities with land sales and um, the need for additional funds were that to take place. And so, again, this is something that we would work on, but um, we have a, a potential opportunity in some of these projects, and, and likewise with Slate Canyon Park. Um, if the council has any questions on those, Scott and Thomas are here to answer the questions you may have on any, any of the parks projects. The next um, department is on page 92. Um, this is the Provo 360 um, project that we've chosen to account for independently. This is kind of giving you an update on where we are, where we're partially through this this process and we have another uh, large year of expenses as we go into heavily phase two of the project these are the, the parts of the projects that will affect most of the line crews and the utilities um, and, and also our utility billing system so those, these are major um, revamps of all of those systems and they will have to integrate to the portions that we've already implemented for the rest of the city um, it is it is a big project, but it's one that we're making good strides towards, um, even if there are some delays along the way. Um, page ninety four um, has the B and C funds. Um, these are largely status quo um, projects. There are some unfunded projects on the next page that are kind of out there. On again, these are these are issues that. Will need to be tackled. We haven't identified funding for them, and um, there is some 
some desire for for um, roads to receive additional funding, but but um, where that might come from and how that might might result is, is still in discussion. So. Um, page one twenty has sanitation projects. There are only two, and and these are um, not new projects. Um, there are across the public works funds. You'll see this uh, this public works facilities improvements. This is to upgrade some of their the the, the facilities to better fit their current needs. And um, and and similar to this lift is also in a, a couple projects that it will be spread across those. Items. This is a an additional lift for the fleet facility to fund or be able to, to lift larger vehicles. Um, so 123 has the stormwater projects. There are two major changes in this one: um, the West Central Storm Drain or Franklin Detention Basin, and the 820 North Oakmont Storm Drain. Um, I don't know if there are questions on that. The utility transportation fund on page 133 has its status quo projects of, of um, this is maintaining currently existing roads through um, overlay or crack seals. These are funds that come specifically from the utility transportation fee that is collected on utility bills. Um, page 136 has um, the vehicle replacement. Can I go back to the UPS yes. for a moment with that? Yes, yes. 23 some page 133 yeah that uh, the amount there is is that what we collect how much do we collect from you we actually have been collecting a little bit more than that um, and so they've been building some fund balance um, with the opportunity that they might they might use that for some larger projects in a shorter time frame but um, and they've carried over some some of that balance as they built it and I think Dave Graves is working on plans to utilize those funds. Dave Decker might be able to answer your questions on that. It's not a lot. More. It's not. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's it's a little very, bit more. Very, very close. So what determines uh, the overlay expenses? Is that just ad hoc when when do, when somebody uh, how do, how does the prioritization happen? So when the UTF was first established, we went through, we had a study uh, done by an outside consultant and they did a priority list for us. We're, we're basically following that priority list. And it's, um, you know, especially as a new council member, one of the things that we're focusing the UTF funds on is keeping the good streets in good condition and not trying, there's oftentimes a strategy of thinking, oh, you've got to go and tackle the worst uh, streets. That's actually uh, the worst way to use your your street funding. So, um, you know, the slurry seals, the, the the crack ceiling, things like that. That generally um, it's just your your annual maintenance. That's where a lot of the money is focused. Um, but we are we, we are following a very consistent pattern established by the by the consultants. We're actually scheduled. I think it's next year, or the following year, to reevaluate all the streets, the conditions of roads. And the one percent transfer, where are we accounting for that? So there is a portion of the utility revenues that that one percent actually goes into the um, engineering yeah, fund, and um, it's netted out with the engineering division in the general fund. And so, basically, that that covers the operations of the engineering fund, and any excess above that goes into paying for additional new roads. Justin, I, I'll provide one other answer to the question about the roads. We actually have a schedule, so if, if any of the council members are interested in looking at the next five years, we actually have a, a map that's color coded that's going to identify the exact roads that will be maintained for the next five years. And the last one. Yes. So you can see the overlay and where, where the money's been spent. Yes, that's correct. So page 136 has the vehicle replacement CIP. Um, there. Currently, the, the fleet committee is working on um, these two years and additional. So they, a, a couple of years ago, there was a uh, effort put forward to to right size our fleet and and to get us to the level that we felt like we could be sustainable. Um, portions of this were were included in that five year plan that we're now well into, and so they're going to work on updating that for future needs as we go out and um, as we make decisions around 
how many police officers we might have, those, those types of decisions will affect how we might program the dollars and how many dollars we have available for purchasing vehicles. Any questions on this? So, so, so these we won't actually spend two million dollars on non-departmental vehicles, but we will spend at least two million dollars on vehicles. So rather than put nothing or a random selection of amounts, we just put a, a an amount, a single dollar amount in. So is that in 2019 20 because of new officers? And where is that going to come from? So the the police portion here or the the eighty thousand. The, the difference yeah, between the totals. Oh, oh. So there is there is a the idea between behind the vehicle replacement CIP is that it works like a bank in that we finance our own vehicles rather than borrow money. So what we've tried to do is make the general fund have a predictable annual payment while the purchases um, we've tried to smooth out over time. So and we so have money for that one three. Yes. We do. We there is actually a sizable fund balance. Um, yeah, a billion dollar difference in the next fiscal year. Yeah, and so there, there is some over money. and under that it comes in, but there is there is enough in there that if we were to hire additional police officers this year, we could finance through our own vehicle bank the vehicles for those police officers. Um, and so this is this is working well. There is a increased funding from the prior year. Um, for the general fund, so that'll be included in the 2019 budget. The general fund is contributing an additional $300,000 as part of this plan to to get on a sustainable path for funding our, our vehicle replacement. And um, it does go up again in, in fiscal 21, and they're looking at whether or not that needs to go up further in the future, as it likely will, because costs will never do anything but go up. So. Back in the, uh, the recession era in 2006 and seven. Um, vehicle replacement actually took a pretty substantial hit, um, and um, and it was a it took us five or six years to dig ourselves out of that <laughs> situation. So we've really been having learned a very difficult lesson back then. We've been really trying to come up with a system that gets us on a very sustainable path, so that regardless of what happens with the economy, our fleet is you know is in a position where it can continue to be replaced placed effectively um, but it was we had two or three years where we spent next to nothing on vehicle replacement and it was it was painful to get out of it's got a question about vehicles also in terms of um, the kinds of vehicles you buy is there has there been conversation about uh, electric vehicles hybrid vehicles um, I think that's that's always part of something that the fleet committee looks at and compares the, the value versus the cost and um, I don't know any of the specifics on our, our Dave. I don't know if you could speak to some of that question specifically. Yeah, I'm on the committee. We were just talking about electric vehicles in our committee meeting last week, and there have been real challenges in the past, but one of those things that we're looking at, we've also looked at and evaluated natural gas, particularly for our sanitation or garbage collection vehicles, and so we're looking at a lot of alternatives. We looked at having a natural gas fueling station at one time and so i think we, we, we want to make sure that whatever decision we make that that number one it looks out for the environment that it's also cost effective but those things also the types of vehicles nancy who's our fleet uh, manager kind of has recommendations but the committee provides their input and we try to make sure that we're selecting the the right type of vehicle and also replacing and the, the right vehicles that need to be replaced yeah, just uh, because because most of the transportation is so local, right, on, on these vehicles, yeah. so it seems like uh, the efficiency, fuel efficiency is really bad when you're not kind of driving. So hybrid and electric not only are better for the air, but there's uh, a lot of savings. And it seems like the durability, and I don't know if these automobiles, these vehicles are typically transitioned into sale at a certain point, but their durability over the long term is also much better. The maintenance is more on those. What's that? The maintenance is more on them too. So, well, some of them, yeah. I mean, not not so much hybrid vehicles. Uh, maybe electric. I don't know. Yeah. One of the challenges that we face in public works, um, John mentioned the natural gas and sanitation. It's um, I think it was last year, the year before, we actually had a vendor bring <coughs> vehicles for sanitation, and 
on the foothills create, still create a problem for many of gas vehicles, especially when they're loaded. You just can't get under those. We have for our little, our little run around cars, uh, obviously electric. Um, the problem we have is the big trucks where they have to be running and with the with the boots and things like that. And that's the tough thing because I don't think we batteries to support a pickup are there yet, but I think we're keeping an eye on that. I've, I drove over here in the boat just today, which I love. It's been a great car. So I think the good thing about those is I think they are supposed to get 500,000 miles on the electric cars, whereas the, the combustion engine is worth about 150,000. So yeah. I think it's a good investment to look at. Question. So on, on the vehicles, we used to think that natural gas was really great because it was going to get us lower emissions. But how does the natural gas now compare to the results of the tier three gasoline we're going to be using? And is natural gas still worth doing if you're doing tier three, three gas? I don't know the answer to that. I, I, know. I think those are questions that we need to be asking. Can we ask our uh, sustainability coordinator those questions? Somebody ought to have an answer. John Mike. Sorry, that was the joke. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when we get one, we, we really might have one, right? So, uh, page 137, you may or may not be sick of hearing about this, but wastewater um, has some projects that may warrant some discussion, um, and we've had a fair amount of discussion on, but um, decisions being made, and I think we're making great strides on, on answering some of these questions on what we're doing on the west side and, and with the reclamation plan, George. Might right, these change when we make the final decision? Absolutely. Yes. So this this document is included and, and presented to you for informational purposes, but the actual adoption of the budget will be done through our normal annual process. So we have until then to make additional changes, ultimately to the end of June. Because we haven't decided how to fund this year. Right. And so we're we have until the end of June to decide at least what we're going to do for fiscal 19, um, whether or not we have made decisions for what happens beyond that. There are other questions. So there will be some changes that may take place between this document and the final budget that you'll see in June or May, um, but or what gets adopted in June. But um, largely, we try to to communicate any of those changes. The, the, the case of this particular project. Uh, yes, yes. This one, this one is more sensitive, and and likewise with the fire station, right? If we'll, we'll communicate to you. Um, and we're actively working on solutions to some of these issues that, that will be included in the budget that we'll present to you. Um, page 154 has the water department's projects. Um, those, those ones at the end that are asterisk, um, they have some, some additions or changes to them, um, but largely much of this is just this. That is the last summary, so if there are no further questions. Yes. I, do, I do have one, uh, page 109, and let me say, every year that I've been involved with this, maybe it's because I'm gaining a little more experience, but every year this, this seems to be improved and clearer and more transparent and more useful and helpful. Uh, the asterisks are, are very helpful. Uh, so thank you. Um, so let's jump to, to 109. Um, I'm looking at this page sheet, and I think it's the first one I came up with. Came upon, um, and it says we're going to be putting in $165,000, not this coming year, but the year after that. Uh, nothing else on the, the, the schedule, and uh, in the notes it says, uh, in order to uh, maintain our streets, we should be spending $4 million a year. And I mean, that's huge red flags for me that, oh boy, we should be doing $4 million a year, and we've got $165,000 for a single year. Um, it wasn't until later I, I realized similar ones came up two or three more times that, that talking about um, street overlay. But if there was some way to kind of tie those together, or even even just a note, I guess down there that this is this is just one part of four different funding sources that will get up to a total of you know, just, just just yeah. So so page ninety four is is going to have that summary that you'll actually be able to see. Um, so Public Works has, in, in some areas, you might see just a street overlay project and then have a line for each, and just one line for it. But they have the 2020, 2021, 22, 23. And you'll see these projects are related. 
these okay. these projects um, are are uh, I think still under discussion on how much funding in each year might be included, and um, they were adjusted based on where we were seeing trends in the the revenues for the for this BNC fund. I'm comparing that to four million dollars, and we're still not. And Dave, I don't know if it's worth worth you addressing. I I, I, I did try to express to girls a desire to increase funding for roads, um, and and we're working through some of the the intricacies of that. But but uh, four million dollars is is a is a big change. So. I'm not sure if any of the council members were here when um, there's probably a few when the the UTF was originally adopted, but we went through a year year and a half worth of a study, and there was um, some recommendations that came out from uh, primarily from the consultant that did the uh, the street evaluation that I mentioned previously, and he had recommended it. that's where the four to five million came from the, from that study. But we agreed with the council um, that we thought we could probably do it for a little bit less than that. So when you look at the UTF, the BNC road funds, the general fund that contributes some to uh, street maintenance, that's that's primarily what is going towards street maintenance. And we could work with finance and do a, a quick summary, but it's coming from about three, four different sources right now. And, and, and that's what I noticed. Once we got to the, the UTF, you know, okay, there's 2.3, which, which gets us very close, or gets a lot closer than, uh, you know, 165. Um, with all of that together, where do you think we're, we are? We're not in the 4 million, but we're probably about three, some, somewhere in the neighborhood of three. Okay, thank you. Anyway, that, that, that's one that's one piece that when going through this, I, I was confused for quite a while, and if there's a way to tie that, that, that would be a, since you've been able to so amazingly accommodate all the other requests, that might be something we'll in the future. I think some of this is balancing um, what the departments would like to see happen versus what we reasonably expect to happen or, or what we're currently planning for, and we've largely let the departments kind of include what, what they feel their need is, and, and no one knows better than Dave Graves and Dave Decker on, on what the needs are for, for BNC. So rather than than me say, well, how much? But we, we could we could try to consolidate or relate some of those items. Um, but yeah, we might have to look at some restructuring. Right. I don't know. Another way, about what you're saying, Dustin, is, is that this these CRT sheets, these entities are not filtered. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, I, I yeah I, I didn't exactly what the departments have expressed. Yeah. But I still think what you brought up uh, is a good point. That we need to make sure that everything flows together and that it's that it breathable and that it's easy to understand what we're, what we're finding and what we're not finding. All right. Again, I'm happy to work with finance and get some kind of a street maintenance summary so that the council can see all the funding sources in one location. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, that is the 172, 74 page CIP packet um, for your council. If you do come across any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me or I, th I think any of the directors would be happy to answer your questions on these projects. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Justin. We're scheduled for a short break. Let's take five minutes. Let's take that five minute break and we'll start in 2.30. So. Okay, we welcome you back. We'll move on to item number five now, a discussion on a proposed zoning ordinance amendment to section 14.41, major home occupation, to extend daytime business hours from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. 7 p.m., are we still dealing with that? Um, and a discussion of possible changes to the home occupa occupations chapter generally. 17. Robert, please do. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this uh, particular item has evolved a little bit, uh, but I just wanted to come and, and kind of give a little bit of background on, on the original uh, text amendment that had been uh, submitted by the applicants, John and Laura Johnson. Uh, they had submitted a request to amend uh, section uh, 1441 uh, relating to uh, the hours that one employee uh, can be on the site for a major home occupation. 
Uh, their uh, original amendment had been to amend that, those times from uh, ending at five o'clock. Currently, currently the code allows one additional employee uh, to be on the site from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And their amendment was to uh, change that from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, that amendment went to the Planning Commission and through some discussion and, and um, uh, eventually the Planning Commission made a motion uh, to recommend that, that, that those hours be amended from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then that's the recommendation set before you on this specific amendment. I understand that uh, Mr. Sewell has uh, many other things that he wants to discuss, but if you have any questions particular to me and, and those specific employee hours, I'd be happy to help or answer those. Just wanted to point out that the way I understand it, the employee hours is separate from when customers come out. So uh, customers currently uh, are allowed to come at any time uh, because the uh, homeowner or whomever is residing in the dwelling can currently operate a home occupation at, at any time. Correct. And so currently the code only regulates the hours that an additional employee can be at this site. Any further questions for me? No, just, right now, I'll just, just yield my time to Mr. Sewell. <laughs> Thank you. So I've been uh, looking at this home occupation ordinance for a while. Uh, I've been working with several constituents who are here today. I appreciate Rachel Luke and David Wright being here. Um, and uh, this, this proposal that I'm presenting today is actually uh, completely independent of the one that you just heard, but there is a relationship here, and the reason we're talking to together about them is the proposal on hours is different in, in the proposal that I'll be presenting. Um, as I was working on this, I learned that community development was also talking with constituents and had, had several suggestions as well, and so we agreed to combine them all together uh, in, in this proposal. So I'd like to start, um, Kelsey, could you bring up uh, Earl City Code? Oh, you've already got it up there. <laughs> um, I wanted to start with the purpose and intent section. I think this is really important. Uh, starting, uh, starting right at the beginning of the paragraph, to encourage the majority of business activities to be conducted in appropriate commercial zones, Business activities may be conducted within a residence on a limited basis if such activities comply with standards in this section. All home occupations shall be secondary and incidental to the residential use. The use should be conducted so that neighbors under normal conditions would not be aware of its existence. So that's that's kind of that purpose and intent statement was kind of the guiding principle that. I've been using as I uh, work to develop these proposals. Uh, now, Kelsey, could you bring up the executive summary document uh, before? So I'll just kind of walk through each element of the proposal. Uh, the first one involves the definition <coughs> of customer. Um, in the current code, there's a little hyperlink on the word customer. If you print it out, you won't see this, but if you click on it, it, come, it pulls up a defi definition that defines customer as a patron of the business. And in, in all the uh, uh, dictionary definitions I've found, a patron is a person, uh, an individual. Um, so I believe the intent of, of the ordinance is that customer means a uh, person, but there has been a little uh, ambiguity about that. We've had some, uh, a few home businesses who have looked at that and thought, well, um, this large group is a single customer, and we have had impact in neighborhoods where we have had large groups that have been uh, 
treated as a customer and we had an enforcement effort that was called off at one point because of a little uncertainty about that. So, so one objective is just to clarify with a very clear definition that customer is an individual, not a group. That's, that's one aspect of the proposal. Um, another aspect is hours for customer visits and outside employees. Now, one thing I noticed um, as I looked at the ordinance, it does, as was mentioned, there currently is a specification on outside hours for employees, but there's no mention of hours for customer visits. I've looked, I think that's a problem. The potential impact from customer visits is much higher. And I've looked at 10 different ordinances from other cities just to kind of get a feel for what them do. And a lot of them do specify hours for customer visits. Um, in, in Provo, we've had cases where uh, multiple situations where people have been woken up at night by customers leaving a home business very late in the evening, in some cases even past midnight. So I, I am proposing that um, we do put some limits on customer visitation. And in this proposal, I'm proposing that the higher volume customer visits that are allowed for a major home occupation, let me back up for a second and just kind of remind everyone. So there's two classes of home occupations. A minor home occupation can have up to two customer visits per hour under the code. A major home occupation can have up to six visits per hour. A major home occupation can have an outside employee, whereas a minor home occupation uh, is not allowed to have one. So as I looked at the original code, my best guess is that the intent of limiting hours for an outside employee was to limit the higher impact from, potential higher impact from a major home occupation. You have an outside employee, doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have a high volume of customer visits, but it facilitates, it makes it more likely. So my proposal here is to limit customer visits at a volume beyond two per hour, which is what allowed is what is allowed for a minor home occupation to those same hours of eight to five that are currently in place for outside employees. Uh, and then on the lower volume customer visits for minor home occupation, I was going to propose eight to nine. Because there's just not as much impact. And, and then I'll show you a chart of some of the other cities. And the ones that have uh, lower lower volume of customer visits do tend to allow later hours. But what I haven't seen, or very rare anyway, is the combination of both the high volume uh, customer traffic and the later hour uh, for the customer visits. So that's kind of the rationale for the two, um, two different time approach there. Um, next item, accessory apartments and home occupations. Uh, this was an item that came from community development based on a, a situation that they've been working with where you basically have uh, impact because of an accessory apartment, additional traffic, additional vehicles, and parking. And when you combine that with potentially high impact of a major home occupation, it's, it's a lot um, of cumulative impact for the neighborhood. So their suggestion which I agree with is that if you have an accessory apartment to not allow a major home occupation, you can still have a minor home occupation due to the lower impact, you know, up to two customer per hour, but not uh, not going into that. Uh, this next one was also a suggestion from community development uh, based on a situation they ran into where business had, I think it was three outside people coming in to work of the business, but they were claiming that several of them were volunteers, and really the impact is the same whether the worker is paid or not, so we just suggested uh, <coughs> clarifying that an employee could be either paid or not paid. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, promotional meetings. Did, did you touch on the Austin Street parking? Uh, I haven't got to that one yet. Okay. Um, the uh, the uh, definition of employee. Definition of employee. Oh, I skipped that, didn't I? <laughs> okay. Um, so let's back up to 
five street parking in. Uh, this was also a suggestion from uh, community development, basically to, and feel free to jump in if I'm not summarizing this appropriately, but to require that uh, a home occupation have sufficient off street parking available to handle uh, projected employee and customer traffic. And just for clarification, that doesn't mean that employees or customers can't use on-street parking. They can use on-street parking in front of the house. They can actually use it anywhere because we don't really um, enforce against on-street parking if there's not a parking permit program. But in, in some problem situations where on-street parking isn't available, they've actually had cases where people have double parked in the street to drop off and pick up and it's caused some safety issues and so they would like the ability to uh, in problem situation be able to require that there's sufficient off street parking. Bill do you want to add or clarify or no you're doing great. In fact I think we should hire you on staff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hear he has free time. <laughs> some days actually that sounds pretty good. <laughs> uh, definition of play. Uh, so this was another one brought up by community development with a situation where they had, I think it was three uh, workers in the business. The business was claiming that uh, some or all of them were volunteers. As we were discussing it with them, the impact is basically the same whether they're paid or volunteer. So we thought it would be good to clarify that uh, outside employees uh, means either paid or not paid workers. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, oh, I think I skipped, oh, it's promotional meetings, there we go. This was uh, pointed out uh, by Mr. Stewart. We were, we were talking, he reviewed the ordinance, thank you. Uh, I support all the changes you suggested. Thank you. Um, he pointed out to me, I had noticed this, that there was a clause about promotional meetings that seemed to imply that uh, the customer visits don't apply. The customer visits limitations don't apply for promotional meetings. And I had noticed that, but hadn't really thought about it until I talked to Mr. Stewart and he, he mentioned that it looks like there's no limit here. So I went home that night and I was envisioning 50 or 100 people coming to a, you know, a backyard meeting or a basement meeting. And it seems like we ought to have some kind of guidance and limit there for that. And, and so that's why uh, we're, we're suggesting you limit the maximum numbers of customers attending a promotional meeting to 12. And by the way, in the code, it says you can have one promotional meeting a month for minor home occupations and four for a major home occupation. Can I, can I ask a question sure. about that? So if uh, it seems like it's kind of difficult to control that exactly. I mean, so you're a preschool and you say, um, having an information <coughs> meeting about the preschool and 25 people show up and just take the first 12 and kick everybody out. Um, is that what? I mean, I, so that's part of my question. The other part is why? Why did why twelve uh, as opposed to I don't know fifteen or twenty or six? I mean, what was the logic behind twelve? Be happy to share that. So actually, the the first number I came up with in my mind was twenty five. I thought that would be kind of the outside limit of you know, what I what seemed reasonable, and then I thought, well, you know, if we're talking once a week or maybe four times a week, that would be a lot. Four times a month. Four, four, four times a month. Sorry, once a week. Thank, thank you. Uh, and then the other thing, I got to thinking about the fudge factor. And whatever number we put here, it's probably going to take fairly regular occurrences of going over that number before anyone would notice or complain. So I thought it's probably better to start a little low. So in my mind, I'm kind of thinking somewhere between 12 and 20 might but let's start on the low side. So that, that's how I came up with the number. Yeah. I, I thought 12 was as much as I could stand. Quite yeah. right, that's five or six cars. And if preschool, they need to have three sessions and they're gonna have people come. Yeah, 50, I, people, I, 50 people at an right. angle. I guess I'm just thinking, I mean, if, it, if, if, you, if you limit it so to such a small number, then you, you potentially increase the frequency of these meetings. only have so many. Yeah. But then you might, you're going to max out. I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't have an opinion on this. I'm just sort of thinking this through and wondering if if we're not creating another problem by keeping it super small. I mean, maybe it's the frequency per month that we ought to be thinking about as well as the number. 
Is it 25 people coming to a home with the parking? That's yeah. That, that's way too many in my mind. And provisions. I'm also pro neighborhood. I think I think this is so open ended. I mean, I just appreciate yeah. what David's doing. The other thing I mentioned, concurring with other ordinances, that provision seemed to be relatively unique. I'm trying to remember if I even found one that had that in addition to, usually they just had, you know, you can have this many people yeah. or, or, or whatever. So um, the other thing I mentioned when I get to the comparison is I found that of those 10 cities, Provo is pretty much over here on one end of the spectrum in terms of allowing more customers. We allow outside employee, three or four of the cities don't allow any outside employees. Uh, you know, we allow promotional yeah. meetings. We, I mean, you can do a promotional meeting anywhere. You don't have to do it at the yeah, residential yeah. location. So, and if you want to do a big one, then you rent a room, do it, do it someplace else. Right? And just to respond about the number, if, if you know that the number is 12 and you ha ask people to RSVP so you don't have, 20 coming you know who's coming and somebody's going to bring 12 cars into any neighborhood you're just trying to envision where those 12 cars are going to park up and down your street and the impact right and, and that's a fairly significant number and, and impact. <coughs> so i i i think you're right and typically people have to go beyond the, the 12 before some complaints so you're into 15 or whatever right Exactly. Uh, so this next one, I, I thank Mr. Stewart for this one as well. Um, he was asking me why we have this conditional use permit fee waiver. And just to explain for those of you who don't know what that is, there's a $900 fee to get the conditional use permit. But there's a, a waiver provision in there. If you go around and get a petition from all of your neighbors within 300 feet, then you can get the fee waived. I remember doing that when I got my major home occupation permit, except I think it was 300 or something at the time. But um, I found from community, <coughs> community development, I was a little surprised actually that the majority of people actually don't do that. Um, and sometimes it's because they don't want to bother with it, or I guess sometimes they can't get everyone to sign. And it, it kind of, it's a little bit awkward, I think, for the neighbors to, you know, have a neighbor come and say, here, help me save this money by signing this petition. And then sometimes I think it creates a sense of, uh, since you've signed this petition, now you're going to be ever more supportive of whatever impact the business has. So we're just wondering if there's a reason to keep that. I'm not, I'm not sure what it, what it is. Community development have any? I don't want to see if I need it. Yeah. How would you propose to need it? We're, we're just not wait it. we're just proposing to take that provision out so there's no petition process to to get the fee waiver. So keep the fee. Keep, keep, keep the fee. There is no waiver. There is no waiver. Yeah, so there's be no waiver. waiver. Yeah. I guess there'd be a minor benefit, minor economic benefit for community development as well. Um, so is that the end? I think that's the end of that document. And then if you could pull up the comparison chart. Yeah, we've got about five minutes. Okay. I'll be quick. I just thought you might be interested in seeing this comparison. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he runs a tight ship on the He's doing a great job. Carries on that. Um, so, of the 10 cities, I got most of them up here in, in the graph. And just, just real quick, if you look at maximum outside employees, we've got one, two, three, four. The cities don't allow any at all. Um, some of them have the two classes of home occupations, like we do minor and major. But the ones that allow more customers per hour, some of those are only like for uh, preschools or daycare, which have different rules um, in, in our situation. Some of them that allow more have a limit on the maximum number of customers per day. You'll notice the 24 and the 35. But Provo, where we are right now, where we allow six per hour, and we don't have any limits on the time, even even if even at my proposal of, of limiting it to eight to five, that would theory, theoretically be nine hours times six or 54 visits a day. And if we go with the later hours that some are requesting, like 
eight to seven or eight to nine. If you went with eight to nine, that'd be 13 times six or up to 78 round trips per day. So anyway, that's the proposal. Um, what we're hoping for is if the council is amenable to this, uh, we'd be looking for a motion to send it to the planning commission, get them input on it, and then and then bring it back um, to the council for final discussion vote. Any questions or? I, I have a couple of questions. I've had some. Sorry, David. No, no, you. Yeah. Well, I've had a couple of constituents ask me. Said, we are a unique city. We are the largest. You know, we are the of startups. And a lot of these startups start up in the home, and some of these hours are right here. <laughs> and, and a lot of these are started off out because they're start up because they have another job and they have to work on this startup company after hours. And is that going to hinder some of our startup reputation if we're saying you can't bring employees in you know, or from seven to nine? And I've got people that leave work from my neighborhood four in the morning three in the morning to go to their regular work jobs. Is this, I'm, I'm wondering, are we, in the past we kind of left it to the community development to determine the impact on the neighborhood. Will this limit their abilities to do that? And are we interested in doing that? Limiting what they have determined is appropriate for a, a occupancy, a occupancy business. Yeah. Yes, I think it may well do that, but it, that isn't the only question. The question is balancing that with protection of neighborhoods. And, and it seems like recently we've been having more problems with these, having more impact in the neighborhoods than the neighbors are willing to accept. And so it seems like the time is right to look at this whole thing again and try to rebalance this. I think the changes that are being suggested make more sense than they don't and are, and are worth pursuing. Thank you. I have um, I've got a ton of questions on this, and I know this is early. I know this is going to be going to the planning commission next, and all of that. Um, I don't know if I need to schedule the time to meet with community development or meet with you. Um, I don't I don't know where to begin. I mean, so so if, if if someone's an author, would they need to have? minor home occupation and just to write from their home. Um, what about, I mean, we're Utah County, we have a lot of uh, MLNs. Uh, you know, so if someone is a, a rep for you know, a makeup company, would they need a business, or a, you know, would they need to do this? Um, things like, uh, we talk about employees versus customers. Does it, you know, if we only allow one one employee, but up to two customers per hour, or I guess for a major, it would be one employee or six customers per hour. To me, that six customers per hour is much more intrusive on the, the neighborhood than, than the employee. I, I think I would rather, you know, if, 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 a, if a company doesn't have a lot of customers, I'd, I'd rather, you know, I'd, it'd be much less impactful to have two employees there. Um, and, what else? By the way, there is a provision in there that I was responsible for implementing about 10 years ago. But if you don't have customers, you can actually have up to three employees. Oh, wonderful. So, okay, yeah. good. That, that, so that answers that. Um, I imagine I wouldn't be able to stay past if, if you right. I mean, that the hours would so, I mean, that example that Beth uh, uh, sent in her email about a guy coming after hours to help yeah. code, you, you wouldn't allow that. This wouldn't allow somebody to just come in and spend the evenings one car parked in front of the house to do code with their business partner. Yeah, and that's a trade-off, you know, and that's worth discussing. Uh, some some neighbors, like apparently she has no problem with somebody being there past ten o'clock and leaving late, but we have seen it. You know, we've seen people open up for yeah. things like that, and so. That's the trade-off. <laughs> this is a change at all who has to apply. This is nothing who has to apply. Right. And I'm just trying to understand. And like I said, it, 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 that's way too many questions for, for this. Um, so, so do I set them up with community development? Uh, just a couple, couple of just thoughts. Uh, imagine a photo studio. Someone has a big backyard. And, and this person likes to take pictures of, of families. Well, that those limits will keep, you know, say, a, a family from coming. And, and you know, and if, if that happens once a week 
that's much less impact than 72 or whatever your calculation was of, of, of customers per day. And but 72 per day would be allowed, but a family of 12 would would not be allowed under this. And so there's there's just a lot of I mean, the whole conditional use questions. I, I really feel like I, I need I need uh, some clarity on um, what exactly does conditional use allow require to to, to be used. So um, anyway, I know we're not voting on this. Oh well. Anyway, just those are questions I have. Any other? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I don't have nearly as many questions as Dave, but I do. If you did say something that raised a question for me, and so Bill, if someone has no employees and never has any customers, should they even bother? Are they required to have a license? Yeah, the code itself says you're supposed to get a license. Uh, recently, the state has passed legislation saying that we can't charge for a business license fee in this situation. As we've talked about as a staff, we would still like to proceed with having them get a permit for that modification through us. So we can track them. So we know it's out there. Uh, Mr. Stewart asked a question of the day, how many, do, how many do we have? We have a lot of research to try to figure that out. So it'd be a lot easier. Could I answer this question a lot more simple? We just routinely we get these licenses on everybody, permits on everyone. And community development is working on a process to be able to do these quick and easily over the counter, minor home occupations, quick and easily over the counter. But we'd like to get a permit for them so that we track them. If you use your home for business, I think it's okay to ask for it. Kind of like the, yeah. You have residences and you have businesses, and if you're going to use your business in your home, I think we need to know about it. Let me throw out one last thing. Let me say thank you. I, I really appreciate the effort that's gone into this. I, just because I have questions doesn't mean I'm not supportive of what you're doing, and I, I appreciate it. Gary? Yes. There's one issue to keep in mind, and it's not in this proposal, but as things come through. Um, we, ironically, at times, put a lot of business regulation in the zoning code. And when you put business regulations in the zoning code, and you change the code, you create non-conforming rights. So these changes that we're talking about here don't apply any of the businesses that are currently operating. So one of the things you need to keep in mind is, um, should business regulations be in the business title? We, if you remember, we recently did that with, uh, we have signage provisions in Title 14 that deal with the types of signs that people can put in. But there were certain aspects of electronic signs that the council put into the licensing so that people don't have a non-conforming right to have a sign that's extremely bright. Because if you keep that in the zoning title, now non-conforming rights attach. And then those of you can remember uh, Cooney's. Uh, the rendering plant. Years ago, we had all these regulations dealing with rendering plants and probably it was in Title 14. And all of the difficulty, the city went round and round, and they had been in operation since the 30s and had non-conforming rights. So all these new rules that everybody wanted to put in place deal with a rendering plant had no effect on the only rendering plant in town which they wanted to regulate. And so eventually the council put those regulations into Title VI, which is the business license. And then just as a good old fashioned business regulation, land use non-conforming rights issues don't attach. So you gotta remember everything you're talking about here today, if it were, an, if I could snap my fingers and enact it, it wouldn't affect anybody who's currently operating today. Just following that we'd like to explore that the pros and cons of moving the home occupation code into business licensing because of these some, some of these other issues but we see that as a separate track and and you know we don't need to hold this up while we have those discussions and potentially bring that back to the council's consideration and and one last thing i, I know you know that's good keep, keep the ship moving here but um i'm very open if council members who have questions like like Council Member Harding, if you'd like to meet, if you'd like to meet with some of the constituents uh, with me that have been so helpful on this, and 
we, we have had some of those discussions. We've talked about photographers, we've talked about exceptions, and I don't know how many emails we've exchanged on some of these issues, but on some of them, it just it, it's turned out to be really difficult to codify the exceptions that we've thought of. And and so the this the current approach and you know we consider changing it is more to rely on you know we're complaint based enforcement and if somebody goes a little bit over here or there probably no one's going to notice or complain and you know so there's there's a little bit of that as well so I don't know how the council would like to proceed I mean I would like if, if majority or most feel like we can get the questions addressed while we're going to plan commission and waiting for it to come back. I mean, that would be ideal, but I'm not opposed either if you prefer to have us come back in two or four weeks after we've had a chance for more discussion. Oh, I, I'm comfortable with this moving forward, and uh, I think we can get the answers along the way. I, I don't see any major flaws in this, so I would make that motion if you need a motion. I would second it. Thank you. Is there a way to distinguish between a startup and a home, home occupation? Is, that's, I think you mentioned that concern. Most startups don't stay the same very long, or they turn into a home occupation. I don't know how to. Um, I think my uh, I had a neighbor a few years ago who started one car and that was six or seven or eight and i found him knocked on his door and said scott what's going on he says oh, we'll be moving soon and with scott smith you know you know it's qualtrics but it started again right there in their basement but they didn't they were in violation for a few months almost but as they grew i think they had to go anyway but but they wouldn't have conformed to this they would have let them in uh, but I don't know how to make that distinguishing factor of whether it's a startup or a home occupation. This is going to continue. As we, as we talked about this, how what's the time and how long do you think it would take? I'm going, to be a, I'm going to be a month before it comes back to you from Planning Commission, so that would give time to answer questions and be able to continue your research and fact finding while that's happening. So you'll have something to Planning Commission in two weeks, more or less? Mm -hmm. No, because I think it's too late to put this on an agenda, so it's going to be more like three or four weeks before we get it on to our the planning commission. And so that would be a couple of weeks after that before we would even see that. Well, it comes that's to you really quick at the planning commission. Right. It comes to you within a few days. A few days? Okay. Right. So a month for that. So in the meantime, if we do have questions, is there something that we could be more? Can we get this information to, if we have questions or concerns, to to um, get back with you during the development of this complaint. Okay. So based on the language and the intent of that first paragraph of the ordinance, I think everything you proposed goes along with that because this is the neighborhood first, whereas you would have to change the intent language if our intent was to uh, encourage startup businesses in neighborhoods rather than protect neighborhoods from the impacts of businesses. I don't want to discourage startup businesses, but uh, we have a reputation for helping them. But there's a place like Startup Block where they they have uh, gone out of the way to provide spaces for startup businesses once they get a little bit bigger than they can do in a home they can go down to the startup block and I think that's the natural progression for a business if we were to do this and we got some weeks before those to planning commission during those weeks could we could this be evolving I guess otherwise I would almost want to vote no on this not I, not because I don't support the effort, but I would hate the planning commission to be considering and voting on something if we're still looking at making tweaks to it. But I, so I guess the question is, is um, you know, how much time do we have to, to discuss potential changes before it goes to planning commission? Maybe we should change the motion to bring it back here in two weeks or to our next meeting so we can get look because you might have a tweak that 
takes it much longer to begin with. That's very true. So it'd be a shame to have a tweet to go in because one or two of us thought it would be better. Absolutely. Maybe we should bring back in for a second blank I'd agree with that. I'd change the motion to bring it back in two yes. weeks. And George, do you want to go along with that on a second? Um, bring it back in two weeks. Or sure. Three. Yeah. I so that way we're sure of what we're sending forward. Yeah. Is there a suggestion we can vote on whether we want to add it or not? Yeah. Okay. okay. We have a motion then to bring it back to the council in two weeks for further discussion. Do a work session. Well, yes, is it two weeks? Okay. Whenever the next meeting is, let's say it that way. <laughs> okay, and this can be sent out as part of our information packets. Okay, those in favor? That's as unanimous. Okay, we will now move on to um, item number six a discussion on the general plan amendment. Commercial for residential for 5.128, acres, the land located 49 South State Street, neighbor neighborhood. Um, Justin Wright, sorry. Thank you. So the first item is the general plan amendment that the applicant is requesting. Uh, there's two properties that they are looking to develop on. This property, it's on, outlined here in red, um, and then the property right here as well. Both these properties, um, the site from proposed uh, project that the applicant has in order to help that move forward they're requesting a general plan amendment on this parcel that's currently designated as uh, commercial in the general plan map um, to change that to residential um, to match with the adjacent parcel that they own um, <coughs> so when this item went uh, out to the neighborhood neighborhood didn't necessarily have any issues with residential use um, coming uh, to that site so there's support for the general plan uh, map to change to be <coughs> residential there um, as well as with staff and with uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation to council was to um, approve the general plan map amendment to allow residential on this site to uh, accommodate the next item which is the proposed rezone. Um, so if there's any questions for general plan map uh, item, I can I'm available that. I just noticed the acreage was different on that item and the next. I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so on this item, uh, just this one, so there's two parcels. It'd be just this parcel that's outlined in red, which is 1.5 acres. Uh, the parcel here, it's already designated okay. in the general plan as uh, residential, so that one be included. So. Yeah, so the second item would be the residential, uh, the rezone, um, to rezone this property. It's currently uh, general commercial, but here's uh, both properties here. Uh, to rezone that to a high-density residential zone. Um, the high-density residential zone allows for up to 50 units per acre. The applicant is, uh, is just over the threshold for the medium des density residential uh, requirement for units per acre. And so that's the reason that they're requesting the high-density residential. So that's a difference of seven units that they're over to be able to uh, fall into the medium density residential zone. Um, <coughs> the Planning Commission's uh, recommendation to you on this, uh, was, along with staff's recommendation, 
is that along with the, the rezone that the um, applicant proffer development agreement that would limit the building height to three stories instead of four, which is what they're proposing. Um, this was a big concern that the neighbors had uh, with this project was that it was it was much taller than what the um, surrounding neighborhood uh, has. So if you can see here, the site plan of the proposed project has uh, two structures that will both be four stories. Um, so the recommendation there was to uh, include a development agreement um, to limit the building height. I think if that's the, the direction that the council wants to go is to uh, do that, that the median density residential zone would be uh, something that they could have a rezone to instead of the high density residential because... Justin, that sounds a little bit strange to me that the city is offering development agreement. I mean, saying we want a development agreement, we want you to do this. That's supposed to be done by the developer, isn't it? Yeah, so that was uh, what was discussed at the Planning Commission. Um, if the developer wanted to uh, get that, that approval, that was what the recommendation from the Planning Commission. That? We, they want to move forward as is with the uh, four stories is what they did yes, to us. They have a development agreement if that got them on. Sorry, can we say that again? They, they are in agreement. They would be amenable to the possibility of a three-story three -story structure, or they're... No, they're, they're saying to do four-story building. Yeah, but they're willing to do a development agreement because if you don't do a development agreement and you give them a high-density residential, they can come back next week with 150 units on this piece of property. I see what you're saying. That's barely above the threshold. Right, so they're willing to enter into an agreement that they won't they will keep to this to the, the number of units the yeah. number of units yeah. but they're not they're they're it's current force they're currently not willing to to go below that they would like to build their original proposal and keep it in four stories that's what i believe they're going to ask you to approve that. yes and now i've got additional questions i apologize so just just so tonight, they're going to say, we would like to do four stories. We would like to have, is it 64 units? Yes. And and we'll say, well, that will require your high density residential, which will allow you to do a lot more. And then they'll say, that's OK. We proffer a development agreement that would limit us to four stories and 64 units. If we say, we're not, we're not going to approve anything more than we, we would only approve this change if it, was, if it wasn't going to go over three stories. Then there would be, a, a, I guess, a discussion on whether or not they'd be willing to, to proffer that in the development agreement. And so the other, the more specific question, I guess, is if if we zoned it MDR, are there any height limitations, story limitations on an MDR, or could they do four stories? Um, so in the MDR, they could also do four stories. So if the overall agreement was to do three stories, that would also need to be in the development uh, in a development agreement, regardless of HDR or MDR. So are the height? Are there any difference in height restrictions between MDR and LD, or HDR? Yeah. So the HDR has a 55 foot height, and the MDR is 45 feet. Because these have flat roofs, this is a 45 feet. They did that on purpose to make sure they met the height of MDR. Make sure not to exceed the height of MDR. So it's just the size of the actual building that it would potentially be different if it were um, zoned MDR versus HDR. Or no? I number guess I'm the number of units. Number of units. The number of units. So that's what I mean. The size. So the size of the building would actually shift by seven. By seven. Units. Well, there are eight units per floor. So if you held this to three story buildings, they would lose eight units per floor. That's two buildings. But right. the difference between they want to do an HDR, and if we limited it to an MDR, there's seven over the MDR limit. That's right. Yeah. So a 
effectively, as long as they're not changing the footprint, effectively zoning it as a MDR would effectively limit them to three stories on one, four stories on another. Or that would be to, one way for them to reach the MDR density number of units. If, if they went to MDR and they took off a floor on one building, they'd lose eight units, which would then make them the MDR. Okay. And then just clarification, so, but staff's recommendation going into zoning, sorry, planning commission, was to limit it to three. Correct. And planning commission discussed three, discussed four, discussed a three, four mix, and their recommendation is three. Correct. So in the general plan, chapter 13, spot a couple of things in there to talk about. If you do a high density project on our main road, you should have the traffic going out onto the main road. I don't see even more than point of access to the main road yet. Yeah, so the access points on this are right here on 500 South and right here. Um, part of, so State Street's a, a state road. You got, uh, has jurisdiction on allowing access points onto that state road, uh, the city engineer says that it's not very likely that we'd be able to get uh, egress that close to 500 South. And yet right across the street, you can see two egresses. You can see multiple apartments, and, and they're coming and going. And so here you would have a full block with just a couple of single-family homes and no egress for a massive complex that is about the same size as some of the stuff on the other side of the street. So I, I don't see the consistency if you don't want it to turn down. And I, they haven't even asked, have they? I haven't been involved in those discussions, but there's public works as representative here that might have more interest that you like. I was a project reviewer on this, and the traffic impact study was done, and most of the uh, traffic for the project is well below all the environmental thresholds that are not money important. And most of the traffic does exit to State Street, and doesn't affect the neighboring neighborhoods surrounding it. It's, it's our recommendation to just have the access at 5 minutes south of State Street for this particular development because any other access on State Street at a different location. Safe. You're saying the ones on the other side of the street are not safe? Well, you're crossing. Oh, yeah, yeah, you never like to have accesses, multiple accesses onto a busy road like this where you want to limit those. And so we would prefer, and I'm sure UDOT would also prefer to have fewer accesses on the state street and limit the accesses to major roads. So those are pre-existing and, and we're happy to deal with them, but to the extent that we can minimize those, we will always try to. So you're saying, you're saying it would be less safe. I don't know what that structure is between the two buildings, but that seems like the logical place for... But you, you're saying because, because they, a lot of people would still be using Fifth South anyway, have a second one just north of that, and these are people going right. left and right. Correct. And people pulling out of the driveways on the other side, again, you've got cross, crossing movements that, that, that are unsafe. So congregating them all at one spot at that intersection, then that's, that's where people, where you've got left and right kind of turn lanes, people can anticipate those movements and, and move into the median uh, in a safer manner than this access in State Street. You still have conflicts with the driveways on the other side of the street, I'll admit, you're right. But we can't we can't solve that problem now. All we can do is help to, to create as safe a situation as we can by having just one access there on the five minutes out in State Street at the intersection. The whole problem is bring your question safety. Yes, it's it's a safety issue. 
So, so I'm just trying to reconcile the language in the general plan that says the traffic should not go through the neighborhood. It should go out to the major road. Right. So, and in that sense, this does comply in that it accesses a major road. The traffic, uh, according to the traffic impact, the traffic study, most of the traffic will access State Street and not the local streets. Except for the P, are there residents right there on the north of the south? I mean, sorry, the south of Fifth South? Are those residents? Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, they're going to be majorly impacted, aren't they? I mean, they're just people coming and going constantly right in front of their house. But otherwise, yeah. it's not it's not creating flow through the right. range. So, so when traffic backs up on Fifth South, trying to get on State Street, where where's going to be the what's going to be the alternative route? What's going to go down on Seventh East, probably right. right to Sixth South. Mm -hmm. The traffic study again doesn't anticipate in a lot of backing, backing up of, of traffic problems, even in high traffic hours. Uh, they anticipated that those movements would be difficult to make, so I didn't see a problem. The level of service of that intersection still broke below the thresholds that we would uh, be concerned about. I would just like to point out, since I frequent this area quite a bit, if you're trying to turn left on State Street without a stoplight of any kind, and if there's any volume of traffic, and you're trying to meld into both lanes, that left-hand turn is going to back up. That is a real problem. And I, I, I guess if I wanted to see people backing up traffic, it would be better to see it on their own property rather than all the way down the street, but I, I don't know where without a, you know, I didn't do my own traffic study, but it just my experience is left-hand turns there on any part of State Street without a light is a problem. And I don't argue that. You're absolutely right. Your perception is correct. It's just whether it reached the level of an engineering concern and according to the traffic study, it didn't. Okay. Yes. One, one thought on that. There's, there's currently three curb cuts there, three entrances, and so even if it went from three down to one, that seems like it would be moving us in the right direction as far as the traffic is, is concerned. Um, anyway, that the bigger thing is, is we, we've been talking for a long time about the housing affordability crunch and, and all of that, and and I see this as being a, a really solid step towards addressing that and in, in providing some good quality homes for married students who right now are kind of there's not a lot of good options for them and so they're, they're competing for other homes i think this would be a, a really solid step in that direction um the problem is is i'm, I'm afraid that this does not integrate well with the neighborhood and so if, if we go forward with this people will point to this in the future and say, well, I don't want high-density housing near me because look at what this does. And look, this is what, and, and so I'm really torn on this. I, 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 I feel strongly that we need something like this, but I also feel that there, there's problems with this. And to go forward as proposed with the four stores and everything, I, I feel like we may be making it harder to do projects like this in the future because, because it will have Maybe the impact on, on on the neighborhood. I, I met with with this group, and I thought we had at least some tweaks that we that you know that would lessen it a little bit. Um, but apparently, they've decided to just go forward with their original proposal. I think. I mean, obviously, every project can always improve a little bit, but I think that with just, I think there's some some impacts on here. I think there's some some tweaks on here that could be made to make it have a much integrate much better into the neighborhood. Like what? I personally think four stories on State Street are fine. You know, and, and I think we would almost use that as a as an incentive that hey we'll we'll give you those four four stories, but we'll put we'll keep it out on state. I think that back building if 
if it is brought to fifth south and instead of having that boxy urban look to it um you, you drop it down maybe even to the two stories or or a third story but half to the half underground um but right now you've got your, your neighbors on the other side that, that what they look at is a giant parking lot that's not very neighborly that doesn't feel like a neighborhood that feels so so by bringing that up that would also allow you to have an egress out to state street and not lose your 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 uh your playground which i think would be important but but if, if you were to design if you were to drop the density on the one keep the density on the other high bring it to face the street so it feels like neighbors maybe make it look feel more like a town hall, less like an apartment building I think that would, I think you build something like that, I think the neighbors after after a year would say, hey, we actually really like this. This has been a great addition to our neighborhood. I think you'd have less opposition in the future. Okay, okay. George, and then this and is for your council. Remember what you call the changes that the developer made that the to This developer said they have literally, it's an upper okay with them and take another. That's what I was speaking. This is on the agenda. Any of the questions? This is on the agenda for tonight. And for council meeting. So thank you, Dustin. Are there, let's see, we, are, we have an item number. Um, number was it? Number. Number eight, oh, a discussion on a text amendment. Um, and Corey, I, how important is this? We've got something that, on the next one. Is we have, we postpone this one week? I mean, two weeks. Yeah. Council members, like, what's the rule, Brian? Help me with well, this. I was just saying, we handled this a number of times by just having the presentation be made in the evening meeting instead of here. Would that be all right if we did that? Yeah. Okay. Because I think we do have to teach an item here the next time. I think we need to have a little discussion on it. Then you can force it to be continued. Okay, but it's not going to force a decision anymore. No. Okay. Okay, a discussion on the town, on downtown Provo parking structure terms of agreement and uh wayne mr chairman we'll also be talking about this in your action agenda this evening so what i'd like to try to do and i know recognize we're under a tight time constraint because we do have a couple of important items to talk about between now and 5 30 but uh, let me just kind of hit the highlights go to the next slide um, so just to give a quick background uh back when the county convention center was in the development stage uh, the city and the county reached an interlocal agreement uh, that defined the city's uh, efforts at providing um, parking to meet the needs of the uh, convention center as defined by the uh, zoning ordinance and the planning commission's uh, standards. And that number came to 350 parking stalls that the city was obliged to, to make available to the convention center. And again, you know all the background in terms of how there's been a divergence of opinion about what that uh, interlocal agreement uh, meant uh, between the city and the county. And that resulted in the county, um, despite our best efforts, filing litigation, alleging a breach of our interlocal agreement, and filing an eminent domain action to, to uh, take by eminent domain from the redevelopment agency and from PEG development property sufficient to park 350 parking stalls um, on what's been known as the R.C. Willie block, or the block immediately north of the current, um, where the current uh, Hyatt Hotel project's underway. Um, and so, uh, so the parties involved, next slide, are um, to this agreement are the city, the redevelopment agency, Utah County, and PEG Development. Uh, PEG, in part, because they were a, uh, they were also filed on by the county for an eminent domain action and because they own strategic property in this area 
uh, that made it, to, as, as council knows, made it difficult to reach conclusion without them in the picture. Uh, so let me just, again, back up a little bit. As the, uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, so there was an effort to create a, and, and in fact one was created, a community development area subject to tax and current financing on the block immediately north of the convention center. Uh, this was, one, again, proposed by PEG uh, several years ago. It was going to be a mixed-use project with residential, office, and retail uh, with a uh, structured parking uh, on the block that would support both the development and the 350 stalls for the Utah Valley Convention Center. The city, as a part of that deal, was prepared to put $2 million in cash into the deal along with a, uh, a parking grant, which had been received by the um, uh, by the city for convention or for parking related to the downtown uh, and tax increment financing that would be generated by that project. So all of that was sort of in place. So there was property, cash, tax increment um, that was all proposed to be there. Um, unfortunately, uh, as the deadline was looming uh, for what we'll call Build America bonds, which was the financing mechanism that PEG was going to use for this project, they were not able to close on the property from the prior owner in time to take advantage of the Build America bonds. And thus the, um, the CDA or the project for Freedom Plaza became unfeasible for our PEG. Uh, we made a valiant attempt to trying to resurrect that uh, before the uh, deadline that year for the loss of the Build America bonds. And unfortunately, we're not able to get the county commission to go um, with a proposal that would have resulted in constructing that project, allowing PEG to develop it by putting some additional cash into the equation um, that would have obviated the need for us to be here had we been able to pull that off. Um, so uh, PEG finally went back to the owner of the property and said, okay, we're still interested in this project. We think we found another financing source. Uh, we'd like to acquire it. And of course the price had gone up in the interim period. And so PEG actually acquired the property on that basis and at the same time as the state was looking to build a new state courts building in downtown Provo. And because of their property constraints to get enough square footage for the state courts building and their own parking facility, the Freedom Plaza block was really the only one that met, their, met the state's requirements. And so again, in an effort to try to prevent worse things from happening and this is in the old no good deed goes unpunished category. Um, we, uh, we engineered a land swap, which allowed the state courts to build on the block where they're currently building, um, and, uh, and then created a shared, so where the city owned the balance of the existing state courts block. So Peg owned the cor owns the corner where the Pyatt's going in, the city owns the north half of that block, and then the city and Peg split the, um, the Freedom Plaza or the uh, R.C. Willie Block, east and west, and so so that's kind of how the how the trade came down for the state courts property. So um, so they've come back now with a proposed development, and council's seen this before. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, so the original idea was to develop office and residential on the R.C. Willie Block, two office buildings side by side with the, an apartment complex on the north side adjoining the Smith's uh, grocery store development and then parking on the north half of the existing courts block where this, that the city already owns. That was the original proposal. Um, so the, uh, we were marching down that path until the eminent domain action was filed which then put a, created a chilling effect because the eminent domain proposals right smack in the middle of this uh, existing development. And so we recognized, I think we and PEG recognized that finding a solution for the parking associated with the convention center was the key to getting all of these pieces put together uh, to make the development work. Um, and so uh, what I'd like to do now is run through um, after, first of all, giving uh, credit where credit is due to Mayor Kafusi and Mr. Paxman and the city's legal team who have negotiated a settlement agreement with the county. So what I'd like to do is kind of walk through the key components of that 
uh, that current agreement as it currently stands and then define sort of next steps uh, for the city. Um, so we go to the next slide. So parking agreement terms, I'm gonna kind of walk through party by party and talk about uh, what the terms are. So the first, uh, first one is the redevelopment agency. And so, uh, so the terms of the agreement currently would be to transfer the land uh, on the north half of the existing courts block. So, and again, I'll show you a map here in a minute that will define all this better. But um, So the area immediately north of the current courts building and the Hyatt Hotel under construction, there's a half block, there are about two acres that, this, that the zoned right by the redevelopment agency. And again, we acquired that as a part of this three-way land swap between the, the RDA, the county, and the state. Um, so we would transfer ownership of that land to PEG development um, and would relocate and expand the Freedom Plaza CDA uh, to the blocks we're talking about here and the blocks that are adjoining. And again, I'll show you a map um, just a minute. Actually, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, which talks about the map. So the agreement as it's currently drafted between the three parties and which uh, the term sheet, which again, you've, you've had a copy of for several days, um, uh, indicates that the, the two blocks that are associated with this development and the adjoining blocks would form a new community development area. Now, as you can tell, that's a pretty dramatic expansion from where the, pro, the original Freedom Plaza CDA was into, into this proposal. So, so that constitutes, again, the two blocks would be the block where the state courts building has been and the old R.C. Willie block that's where it's labeled expanded CDA. And so if you take those two blocks and the blocks which adjoin them, which share a common boundary, then that would constitute the, the revised uh, community development area. Um, and, and there's some good reasons for that, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we kind of get into the, to the costs and benefits. Uh, we would propose to exclude the new state courts block where the current CDA is simply because there's no taxable value there. Um, and so it, uh, it just it complicates the matter beyond what would necessarily have to be done. Um, and then all the increment generated in that area then would support the agreement to build the parking structure to, to accommodate the 350 stalls required for the convention center. So that's sort of the trade-off is the city's contribution, the RDA's contribution, is the land and the tax increment from those uh, new blocks. Um, so again, there's some positives to that in that, number one, we incentivize PEG development to acquire and redevelop property because they stand to gain for the value of the parking structure um, from their development. So if they fail to do anything, the revenue stream is, uh, is insufficient for uh, PEG development. So they're clearly incentivized to, um, to develop what blocks, what areas they can. Um, again, on the, um, the Marriott block to the south, it's currently fully developed. Would not anticipate that there'd be any new increment coming from that area unless there were a redevelopment project there. Um, but the other blocks, and again, we don't anticipate the Smith's block seeing significant increment. Uh, there, there could be some increment from a remodeling project, which is currently underway by Smith's, but, but that's a relatively small, um, small investment. Most of it actually is furniture, fixtures, and equipment. It's not so much the capital improvements to the, the building. So the real areas that have potential for redevelopment would be the two blocks to the east and the one block bounded by 200 north, 300 north, and Freedom Boulevard on the, on the uh, west side. So those, those would potentially have some additional increment access. So uh, let's go to the next slide and talk a little, finish kind of talking about the community development area. So again, one block in each direction, exclude the state courts block, um, all increment in the area to support the parking agreement. Again, it's necessary to do that to defease the city's obligation for the convention center parking. Because as a part of this deal, not only does the county withdraw the eminent domain action and dismiss the lawsuit, they actually, we actually jointly agree to, to eliminate the old um, uh, interlocal agreement for parking. So PEG takes all of the city's responsibilities associated with that uh, as a part of this, as a part of the deal. So all the parking for the convention center would then be associated with, eventually at the end of the process, would be associated with the new parking structures built by PEG. 
Let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, uh, community development area, th this is a very common use of tax increment is to build parking. Again, if you get back to the original roots of tax increment, the idea was to level the playing field with a greenfield development. So it was basically to say, if a development could go to a greenfield and vineyard, or it could go to downtown Provo, how do you level the playing field between those two? And traditionally, parking is the issue. Um, you can, if you go out to vineyard, you can build surface parking to your heart's content, uh, which is significantly less than building structured parking in the downtown. And so it's not at all uncommon. And in fact, we've done it several, a couple of times, and we'll be likely asked to do it again um, to utilize tax increment dollars to build structured parking that again levels the kind of the playing field between greenfield sprawl development and more uh, and more walkable um, you know downtown development that could support that effort. Okay, and then uh, again would support the UVCC as well as the uh, PEG office projects. Okay, uh, next slide. So again, continuing on with the redevelopment agency's requirements, uh, we we included in the agreement that the redevelopment agency could purchase the phase one parking structure. So the first one associated with that, if at any point in the first 15 years of the deal, we decided to park, purchase it at fair market value. So if, for example, the office project didn't fail you know, and failed to deliver the number of um, uh, monetized parking uh, spaces there, and at some point we decided at our option that we wanted to acquire that parking structure, we could still do that. So again, we preserved our right, and then don't know whether we'd ever access it, but uh, we we had, we attempted to preserve our right to acquire that at some point in the future if we wanted to. Okay, let's go on to pegs now. Uh, terms under the agreement. So next slide. So peg would build a three-phase development. Um, phase one would be office building and parking structure that would be on the north half of the existing course block adjacent to the Hyatt Hotel and the current state courts building. Uh, the second phase would be an office and parking structure immediately then north of 200 North um, on the south half of the R.C. Willey block. Uh, and, and the third phase would then be to build an apartment complex. And again, we'll show you kind of the, the map layout here in a minute. Peg would agree also to take over all city and RDA parking obligations that we are currently under contract to provide 350 stalls for Utah Valley Convention Center, as well as... Um, 120 stalls to support the Hyatt uh, Hotel. So that would include 80 dedicated stalls and 40 non-dedicated stalls. And that we're under contract to do that today as a part of the Hyatt Hotel development. Uh, so PEG would assume all of our responsibilities for those two parking plans. Uh, next slide. Uh, so PEG would provide 175 spaces in each stall, each structure, <coughs> So two structures averaging about 600 stalls in each structure, 175 of those would be dedicated in each parking structure for the convention center. Um, and they would be free for, for the convention center for use days. And there's some specific language, and I'll just highlight it quickly as we, uh, as we talk about it. But, um, but there is a specific agreement about how PEG would meet those parking demands. Um, so PEG would then own and operate both parking structures. Uh, the receded in the redevelopment agency would have no ownership, interest, or financial obligation beyond the tax increment uh, to support those parking structures. It allows PEG to monetize the convention center parking as outlined in the agreement. So the county's got to give certain time period of notice to PEG in order to claim the free use of those parking structures. They're limited to a certain number of parking spaces days per year uh, that would be free. Otherwise, they would be uh, paid for by convention center patrons. And then, as we indicated, the Hyatt gets 80 fixed stalls in that first parking structure and 40 floating stalls. And, um, and so, okay, let's go on then. Um, so, uh, so the parking structures, again, 600 spaces each between six and seven levels high. And again, parking structure levels are shorter than office building structure, you know, uh, floor heights. And so again, the, um, so the, uh, the idea of that is that they would basically match the same height of the parking of the office buildings. So they would not be 
significantly higher or lower than the exist than the proposed uh, office project. So they match the scale of the office and the apartment developments. Uh, could I ask? A yes. Bit? So um, the email we received um, about uh, from uh, Jamie Littlefield about eight stories. So it's eight stories, the same thing as eight levels. Yes. Yeah, but they don't think they'll have to go to eight levels. So, um, so again, I think the parking or the office buildings, I think, are five stories, as I recall. And, and so, yeah, so they're roughly the about the same person. height again because so the, the height per level is the same parking same level. Story. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. At least in my description. So yeah, the parking level would. But again, their their height is shorter, um, and so you get more levels. Uh, in a building, in a parking structure, then you get an office building at the same height. But, there, but the, there's also something in the agreement about their possibility of being built. They could one, add right? one. They could add additional levels, yeah, and we'll talk about that in a minute at the county's uh, piece. Okay, next slide. Um, so Utah County gets these twelve thousand six hundred free stall days per year to use as they uh, as they choose during the calendar year. Um, and they get them for free for the first uh, 15 years, after which um, the uh, county would then make a contribution to the operation and maintenance of those 350 stalls, less any monetization that PEG's able to generate. And so if they lease those parking stalls in the off-peak days when the convention center doesn't need them, that's a credit to the county for their operation and maintenance obligation. Um, County may add levels to the structures at their expense. And so if they choose at some point in the future to expand the convention center and want more parking, they have an avenue in which to, to go to PEG and say, we're ready to add a level of parking uh, to those structures to accommodate the expansion of the convention center. But again, the city's not in that, nor is, uh, nor is PEG. And then the county would contribute 75% of their tax increment, which was the deal we had under the old Freedom Plaza CDA, so that obligation just transfers over. The only thing the county has insisted is that um, is that their 75% goes to something other than parking, and so it offsets another PEG expense, which allows PEG to put more money into the parking structure. That makes sense. So that's the that's their condition. Um, and then again, next slide. County dismisses the lawsuit and dismisses the eminent domain action. Okay, so the city now, as we get beyond the redevelopment agency, so the city agrees to uh, to work with them to extend, work with the redevelopment agency to extend the CDA boundary, as we indicated on the earlier map, um, to consider impact fee reductions for PEG. doesn't mean we agree to them. It just says that we'll consider them uh, if they make a specific proposal to us. Um, and so, again, we, we would have to look at what their proposal is and, Council would have to uh, to uh, agree to that at some point. Um, it puts 100% of the city's tax increment, so our share of the tax increment, goes into this agreement for parking uh, at 100% level. And again, that's where we were with the original Freedom Plaza CDA, so the conditions just move. Um, we would have to enforce temporary surface parking for Utah Valley Convention Center during the process. So as Existing surface parking gets consumed by the new office building construction and the new parking structure construction. They will have 350 stalls in the existing surface parking. As those systems come online, 175 stalls will move over. 175 will stay in the surface parking as they begin to develop the office and residential area of phase two. And so again, we'll be responsible for, for maintenance and operation of the existing parking surface that we own and operate today. So get really no additional impact other than what we currently have today. Um, and we would support PEG's efforts to entitle their development. They'll have to go through a zone change process. And again, we would be, be as helpful as we can. Doesn't mandate that we have to accept it. We can't put conditions on it. But it just says we'll support their efforts at uh, gaining entitlement changes. Um, next slide. So here's the, uh, here's the map and kind of how it looks as we overlay the expanded CDA along with the development. So you can see where phase one of the office and parking would occur, um, and then where the additional um, uh, development would occur as, uh, as phase two and phase three roll out. 
Uh, so that's kind of what that eventually looks like. So the idea of wrapping the apartments around the second parking structure really is about trying to provide walkable, habitable, energized space along 100 West. Um, that, uh, you know, that would again add to the ambiance and the walkability of the neighborhood. And again, that was part of the part of their, their working with the neighborhood to find good solutions for parking. Uh, so next slide, and I think maybe have, okay, so yeah, there's a couple more. So actions needed by the council and the RDA to make this deal work. Um, first of all, we have a resolution on your agenda tonight to accept the terms and to direct the mayor, authorize the mayor to negotiate an agreement that meets the terms outlined in the term sheet. And uh, and so that's, that's sort of action number one is to start us down now preparing the legal documents associated with this final arrangement. Um, the redevelopment agency will need to approve the property transfer between the RDA and PEG uh, to accommodate this uh, parking structure um, and office building. Um, we'll have to, the RDA will have to approve uh, moving and expanding the community development area. And the council and the redevelopment agency will need to approve the interlocal agreement. So as we, as we relocate and expand the interlocal agreements from the old Freedom Plaza CDA to the new one, um, the council and the RDA will both take action on those to approve interlocal agreements. So the city and the RDA will enter into an interlocal agreement and the RDA and the school district and the county, in central Utah water will also enter into new interlocal agreements. And so it will be that process of approving those agreements. And then consider the impact fee issues that, uh, that were included in the term sheet. Uh, so those those will be the actions required by the uh, Municipal Council and the Redevelopment Agency. Okay, next slide. Talk about some of the benefits then. Um, we uh, we fully meet our obligation to the Convention Center and we are we're done uh, with that. And so there's that's a substantial advantage uh, to us. The, the effort supports the Convention Center's success, again, by identifying the key parking locations uh, by facilitating, again, sort of in retrospect, the development of the Hyatt uh, Hotel, then that creates, again, that support that's needed for the convention center to continue to be successful. Certainly increases tax revenue uh, for us, for the uh, school district and for the county. So uh, less us because most of our, all of our increment is committed to the parking, but it certainly does create an advantage for the county and the school district in their baseline property tax levy. Is there a term on that length of time? 15 years. 15. Yeah. And yeah. so that CD is expensive. And it's about four times what the freedom it is. Yeah, right? it is correct. Right. But again, that's part of the that, that's part of monetizing the 350 stalls. So Peg's incentivized to provide those to the county. So yeah, that was well, just part of the deal. Does that 15 years start? Like, does it all start together? Like, yes. They have that proposal to develop some of those Correct. Key areas. Is it when they develop it, and then they get 15 years, or is it? Nope. No. It's so it's a 15 years. year, 15 year window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to um, Dave. Yeah, comment? please. So typically, when we structure these interlocal agreements, there's either the 15 year or a cap on the amount that goes through. So whichever comes first is. Um, so uh, the fourth one is to kind of balance what we've been affectionately calling the Lehigh effect, which is we begin to grow businesses in Provo, and as soon as they need more office space, they immediately go somewhere else, and whether it's Lehigh or Orem or Word, Old Word Perfect Campus or whatever it is. Um, and so adding to our net uh, availability of, of significant office space helps us to balance and we're hearing from employers that as much as they, as much as the employers like the broader uh, recruiting base for their employees, their employees don't like the suburban office campus. They would prefer to be in an urban area where they can get amenities like, you know, as Quinn would suggest, 73 restaurants on our uh, restaurant guide he handed out today, and those kinds of things. Um, that uh, that they much prefer, and so it, again creates an opportunity for us to hopefully create a magnet to keep those businesses here as they grow, or to attract them back uh, from from other areas where they can be actually in that sort of urban campus area. 
uh, and leverage our investment in bus rapid transit. Again, we have a station just uh, two blocks uh, from this location. And so again, it gives us additional potential users for the bus rapid transit. And then last slide, um, support the walkable downtown with the mixed use project where there's the opportunity to live, work, um, and, uh, and do all of that uh, and park in the same uh, general area. And again, the parking structures would have those ground level interactions that we've talked about, retail space or habitable space that would create that, uh, that sense of uh, comfortable walkability through this area. And then again, as we always do with redevelopment projects, try to provide a catalyst, uh, critical mass that would allow additional uh, development to occur in the downtown. So, so that's it in terms of the presentation, just designed to give you a quick flavor for what that term sheet looks like. And so you will have a resolution in front of you this evening that um, would sort of take the first step in those next actions as we discussed. So that's it. Be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, our legal teams here, that were, all of which were involved in this discussion, as well as the mayor and Isaac. So. We're going to be doing this again in the... Our, our intent is to do this. Yeah, we'll probably be a little more deliberate about it in tonight's meeting since I was trying to... I already blew the deadline, so sorry about that. <laughs> this is a big deal. This has been one, a couple of years in the making, and and uh, again, uh, great uh, great work on the part of our team to get, get to a resolution on this one that I thought was going to be the most difficult of the ones we worked through with the county, so... Did you want to decide which of the resolutions to put on the agenda for tonight? We probably should. We have, so we have two versions of the resolution. And again, uh, we, we clearly have a preference, uh, largely because of our discussions with the county. So, so there are two versions of the resolution. One authorizes the mayor to, to negotiate and execute a contract as long as the terms in the term sheet are met and they are attached by, incorporated by reference into the resolution. The second one is to authorize the mayor to negotiate a contract and bring it back to the council for final approval. And again, we think that's a little more problematic based on our agreement with the county. Um, and because we we think there'll be plenty of folks looking over our shoulder on the on the term, making sure the terms are met. Uh, because if they're not, then we're not gonna get an agreement with Peg in the county. And so, so yeah, that's just the one you put on for for your um, motion. implied motion at the council meeting this evening. So the motion would be that you consider the first option tonight. Yeah, so I, I, so as I understand it, what, Mr. Stewart, your motion is that when the item comes up tonight, that the implied motion will, the implied motion will apply to option number one. <laughs> okay. uh -huh. And so if we have, I'm, I'm supporting this Go except ahead. for the impact fees. And right. It's, it's pretty I we are going to have huge. I mean, that many apartments, that many people, that use huge impact, on, and we never give anybody else a break. Right. And uh, so that's when we get. If we do the implied motion, the first one, then that just puts it all in your ballpark. Not, well, not the impact the, fee. No, the, the impact, impact fee. You'll you'll have to come we'll through come, the waiver we'll on that. For, right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yep. So then we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Uh, I do have some concerns, and I don't know if now the time to talk about it. Is, is the public meeting the time to talk about the closed session. session? We do have a closed session that we're confronting, so yeah. So probably tonight in the public meeting, or no, we'll be happy to talk to you in between if that would be helpful. That would be it. Whatever you'd like to do. Uh, I mean, part, part of them are you know, specific questions like, is this. But, but part of it is just, let me just, let me just throw this out. Sure. I mean, our, our obligation is a 350 stalls, I guess I heard also 120. We've talked about other ways of, of reaching those things, but yes, those are, those are kind of the obligations. But that's what Provo City, to me, is on the hook for. And in exchange for that, we're talking about giving, you know, contributing roughly $2 million. Two, a, two, acre, two acres of property. Of, of, of property. Right. Um, and then our tax increment for for 15 years for for that larger area a very large a very large area now even if even if no development occurs in those places over 15 years that's roughly 40 percent of you know inflation over four is increases 
by 40% over over 15 years. So now we're, by that, that last year, we're giving away 40% of, of our you know, base on the Marriott and- Except that again, the uh, as without new growth, as, as property values increase by inflation, the property tax rate across the city has to come down uh, because the only advantage we get is new growth. And so if new growth's not occurring, the tax increment will, as as the value of the property goes up, the rate will come down. And so it will remain, again, and it's it, it's difficult to determine because the whole city doesn't go up and down at the same time. Um, but but that will that will fluctuate over time, but it will not, it, you won't get the full value of any increased appraisal unless there's new growth. Does that make sense? We are not giving up the baseline. Yeah, we're not giving up the baseline. Okay. I mean, it's it's a number. It, it's a number, but it's a number less than what you're thinking. Okay. Okay. It may not be a full forty percent, but but yeah. Um, another another thing is we're carving out a huge swath of, of land. Now, what happens the next time we want to incentivize a, a, a project? Oh, sorry, we've already. That's correct. Given that's all that's down. part of the trade-off. Is the school district okay with this? It seems like we're we're already. We had, had the conversation with them. They'll still need to approve the interlocal agreement to do all this. So okay. And, we'll then, and the other thing, you, you talked about how we've used uh, TIF for parking in, in the past. Absolutely agree. It's been in the past. At the end of that, we own those those, those stalls. Now we yeah. ask someone else to manage it, and that's kind of not worked out so well. But still, we're, we're, we're putting in all the TIF for parking. And we don't own it at the end. I just my concern is maybe this That's, this justifies the, the the development, and we really want that development so much. But it just seems like we're giving up whole lots here. And that, yeah. that's my concern. But, but again, I think at the end of the day, the thing to remember is that we are we are on the hook for three hundred and fifty plus one hundred and twenty, um, and so by transferring those now to Peg, that's what we would have owned under a normal scenario. If we didn't have the Utah Valley Convention Center to worry about, uh, we would we would own or the Hyatt, we would own those parking stalls. But that's that they're they're taking essentially taking ownership of those stalls and that's how we meet our agreement and get rid of the interlocal agreement and the litigation. Wayne, so yes. you mentioned just in passing that the school district would have to consider the, the increment tax increment. This agreement is between Peg the county and the city slash RDA. Correct. If the school district refuses to play, does that undo this? I don't believe it undoes it because no, it they're they're not the a part of the agreement. Yeah, it just I makes the tax so. increment available less. Yeah, okay. less tax increment available for the deal. So again, obviously, Peg and the county and the city are all motivated to try to work with the school district and find a solution that works for them. And if I could just add to that real quickly, you may. May not know that there were we were involved with the bonds for the Cubby Center, and the school district opted not to participate in that. So it, it's not mandatory that they have the option. Okay. okay, we have a motion on the table for the first um, proposal. Um, any other discussion? If not, I'll call for a vote. Those in favor? Those opposed? All in favor, except for Mr. Harvey, who is opposed. Okay. Hey, now we have an item. We, we, there's a proposal. We have two items that can be considered in a closed meeting, but we have 20 minutes to the next meeting, and it's our understanding that both those items could go after the regular council meeting. We wanted to consider that. Um, are you? Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah, I think, so I, I think that yeah, we could. Yeah, we could we start our 20 minutes. Let's see how fast we can get things done. Okay, let's start. I can we'll start. Let's 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 start. Let's